And it was just my mom, right? And he was like, oh yeah, how much did that cost? It was like, yeah, 2,000, 2000 euros, 2,000 euros, mm. stuff like that. And he just gobbled it up uh, <laughs> just uh, to make fun of him. Also, yeah, I never... No, that, that's just... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, that, that's just really cringe in the art world. Like the, the the people who are in it just for the like image and the they like the fact that the first thing he asks is how much it costs is really mm -hmm. really telling about what he actually cares about in in the in the art. Yeah, it's how how people perceive like art and that kind of shit, and it's like kind of cringe because it's like uh, well sometimes she likes stuff and sometimes she don't like stuff, right? That's yeah. just the the reality of it. That yeah, and like, it like never mind. Yeah. Go ahead, Elysium. <laughs> the the big titty furry boys don't sell very well, so you know, <laughs> not a good message. That's true. Have you tried? <laughs> I, I I follow like artists on Twitter. They they get commissions, man. They get commissions mm -hmm. for all sorts of depraved shit. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, yeah, I, I've actually heard the sentiment that like if you're uh, whatever random individual artist on Twitter, like if you want to make money, your bread and butter is like drawing furry erotica. I thought that was like the <laughs> yeah. the go to. Pause for mm -hmm. pay or whatever. In the art underground, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure right. like Picasso back in his time dealt with a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. I, to be fair, if you if you go back far enough, it was like incestuous princes supporting the art world, so we're not that far. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, that's always like uh, the the discussions about like music. And that they say like, uh, well, uh, music back then wasn't elitist or something, and uh, basically all the music was funded by by these rich motherfuckers. So yeah. yeah. That being said, uh, let's actually talk about what we are going to talk uh, about today. But first of, I want to welcome everybody. So we have two guests today. We got Socrates TV and Lemonies six six six. So uh, welcome for for joining. That being said, we also we have our lovely panelists. So that's J Chow Life, Elysium, and Namenum. Most of these people here stream. So if you are watching from anybody's like stream, uh, consider supporting them by just giving them a like or donate to to Namenum so he can make his <laughs> ambitions of going uh, IRL streaming uh, a reality. So uh, so yeah. Uh, that being said, like uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today's topic is about uh, Palestine and Israel. Um, so we we kind of yeah like uh, last week I thought it was maybe interesting uh, for us to talk about it. I know that Lebanese, you have a background in like the cultures of like uh, uh, more Arab cultures and that kind of stuff. Uh, I know Elysium knows a lot about like israel and palestine so i thought this is like a good opportunity basically to bring up that topic uh that being said uh i i have uh three different topics that we are going to talk about uh maybe elysium you can just uh, kick them off while i just give you the topic and uh if you're okay with that sure okay so uh the first topic is um, the Israel and Palestine conflict has been going on since the founding of Israel. The West, EU, and US has a good standing with Israel. Should the West engage uh, or change their tone when it comes to the West Bank and the Golan Heights? So, Elise, uh, you can kick it off. Um, sure. Okay. So, we do have a good relationship with Israel as um, the US. People have like my biggest problem with with the conversation in general is people have like insane solutions, um, and not not even like getting into like any state stuff, just like of um, how the U.S. should react to Israel because like right now the U.S. is staunchly defending and vetoing anything against Israel, and the idea that that policy is going to change overnight into like condemning Israel um, is like. Mm -hmm a huge thrashing flip-flop that just feels like absurd um but like no one is satisfied with like the super small steps of like you know maybe the united states needs to um have a better dialogue with israel needs to bring these things up in a like neutral tone or anything like that 
um yeah so i guess that's where my first okay. thought is um go then uh, next up uh, lebanese yeah i think ultimately um it is not a bad thing that countries are collaborating and trying to create partnerships that's literally world politics and like how 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 the world is um i think it's i think it's a good thing when when israel does things that cross over some agree previously agreed upon um things like don't go into don't take more land basically don't overstep certain uh you know borders or boundaries or whatever and when they do that i think it's a good thing for the world community the us and the eu for instance to say hey not chill um but ultimately i think it's a good thing to encourage more collaboration between every country right okay and um next uh name sure um i i do agree with elysium's uh perspective that it's uh like it is a long-standing ally it, we're, we're not gonna like nuke our relations uh with them over or some like war crimes and human rights abuses uh but the reality is uh if we want to if we want to be this like force of liberal democracy in the world uh we shouldn't be hypocrites about it and we we do we should be telling them that when when they do something wrong that it's wrong and uh that, that that dialogue should be there it, it doesn't necessarily have to be like uh thrashing of the relationship but it should be it, it has its place in the dialogue in the dialogue okay and then socrates tv sure so um I'm, I'm looking this up right now it looks like the us has vetoed um at least 53 un security council resolutions critical of israel so it's it's pretty common that the un security council um, all members um, vote for a resolution. That's something like, you know, uh, Israel has to get out of Golan or get out of the West Bank, um, do this or that. And then the the U.S. will just veto it because they're one of the, what, uh, three or four um, countries that can, that can do that. Um, so um, there's, there's a lot of steps from there to condemning Israel, even just abstaining on those votes um would fundamentally shift um the the way that the un is able to um actually decide on these resolutions um but over and above that i mean there's a lot of things that the us has done and is continuing to do that are um directly supporting what what is the the kind of worst things that israel are doing so um trump uh recognizing jerusalem as israel's capital is uh, i mean i'm not even sure how to how to overstate how how bad that is there's um uh a history that i've been reading up on that i think it was maybe the the camp david talks the oslo accords that basically fell apart because they couldn't decide what to do about jerusalem they couldn't agree it's a very contentious territory both sides want to have control and for for a u.s president to recognize um jerusalem as israel's capital does a huge amount of harm. Um, on top of that, there's the amount of uh, military aid that the US gives to Israel. Um, I have this kind of um, pipe dream that maybe um, Biden or maybe somebody braver than Biden could um, start um, making that military aid contingent on something like no new settlements being built. And that starts to, what that starts to do within Israel is it starts to align the security interests of the state with the more liberal elements of Israel. There's really only a minority of Israelis. I don't know if it's, you know, like something like 10 to 20 percent, the religious right who actually want to, to actively really, really care about building more settlements. Um, and they've aligned themselves in the Knesset with the more conservative elements. Um, so actually putting those elements opposed to each other um, for the, the benefit of the majority of, Isra of Israelis is something I think really positive that the U.S. could do. Sorry, that was a very long opening. No worries. Uh, uh, yeah, and then last but not least, our international relationship uh, person, Jay Chow Life. <laughs> Go ahead. I wish I studied international relations. Maybe I wouldn't be single in a version. Um, 
<laughs> so when it comes to Israel, Palestine, and how the West should kind of interact with that, with Israel and uh, its relationships, I am seldom to agree with most people here that, morally speaking, uh, the United States and the West probably should be a bit more, uh, a, a bit apply a bit more pressure onto Israel for its wrongdoings, uh, whether it be human rights violations, even extending to war crimes here and there. Uh, however, I'm also an admin believer, and I'm going to reiterate this. I've, I've done this quite a couple of times is that when it comes to foreign policy countries don't operate mainly on morality and when you really when it really comes down to it what are the strategic interests of the west and the united states for for applying that pressure onto israel there's not a lot especially when not considering how the united states and the west are acting as countries but what are the domestic influences that are occurring in those countries as well? Well, in the United States, I can't say the same about Europe because um, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm unaware about it. But in the United States, there is a huge Israel lobby that is able to use the power of money, advertisements, um, soft power here and there in order to influence United States lawmaker decisions when it comes to any sort of military aid that goes to Israel or any sort of stances that a congressperson may have going to Israel. So like, even if there is magically a president that comes about that wants to apply a lot of pressure onto Israel, well, Israel kind of figured out, hey, we don't need a bet on this. What we could do is influence the, the lawmakers, the Congress, because they're the ones that have the power of the purse. They're the ones that actually have in some regards, a lot more control over what goes out of the United States and what gets applied onto on, onto other countries from the United States. Um, and I, I, I want to say that they kind of saw that there was a potential for the culture in the United States to kind of change to be like, hey, we are we see it that it was no longer worth it to have Israel as an ally if Israel is going to be if we're going to be doing shit like this. So they kind of jumped ahead and be like, okay, well, we got to prevent this. And I, I think it's working for them. I, I don't, I don't see how any realistically, how the EU and the United States could, could divide themselves when it comes to Israel. Okay. Then the floor is open. Who wants to respond? Um, if I could I just, mean... uh, oh, 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 if I could just, just quickly speak to that. So there's a, um, an Al Jazeera documentary um called the lobby and it it explores exactly that which is the influence of um the the israel lobby in the us and in the uk and in the uk there was this whole stink about um like anti-corbin um like anti-semitism smears and this is like the the kind of modern israeli um Mossad basically strategy to to try to smear anybody who is at all critical of Israel as anti-Semitic. Oh, yeah. 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 Go ahead. Um, Al Jazeera is a sussy source. Um, <laughs> speaking from an Arab who's very familiar with Al Jazeera, um, it's, they, they're not as reliable as a news source. They're not as unbiased. I mean, of course, all news sources are kind of biased, right? But Al Jazeera, in the Middle East at least, has a reputation of leaning more towards like, conspiracy like rt ish you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so it doesn't surprise me that they would they would they would uh post something like that yeah but the, what i know about like corbin if we talk about corbin i know the issue there to be fair was more that he didn't uh denounce the people that were in his party that were like openly anti-semitist so i think there is some issue there to be fair uh, but yeah and what's interesting is this is actually not only in the uk this has happened interestingly enough it happened in denmark as well i live in denmark mm -hmm. um and in this i want to say far left but they're yeah pro you would probably call them far left um uh party here in denmark um they had the same kind of what do you call it controversy where there were people in their party that were 
anti-Israel, but <laughs> where it got into like anti-Semitism mm -hmm. territory. And uh, yeah, it's exactly the same things. Um, it's really interesting the 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 relationship between this far left anti-Semitism um, in European countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what seems to muddle the discussions a lot, in, in, in my opinion, uh, on kind of a meta level, uh, like, not only does, is, like, we already addressed the fact, like, Israel will defend itself by saying that any anti-Zionism is basically uh, anti-Semitism, but then on the other hand, you have all, you have, like, genuine anti-Semites uh, constantly gaslight, um, uh, not gaslighting, um, Dog whistling? dog whistling, that's the term. Uh, do dog whistling, uh, using anti-Zionism, but they're actually like full-on anti-Semites. Uh, Sem Semites. It's, it makes the discussion sometimes very, very hard to navigate, uh, depending on who and you're then, talking to. And then in the U.S., you have the even stranger thing, which is the um, very, very anti-Semitic kind of Christian right, who's staunchly pro-Israel. So you have very pro-Zionist anti-Semites as well in the U.S. to to yeah. round out the whole equation. Um. To, I, don't, so I don't know much about the European side, but for the American side, I know the like Israeli lobby wouldn't be nearly um, as powerful. It's probably not even the majority factor as much as that it has that Israel itself has like popular support. Um, so like I, I don't know that I care so much about like tracing the money memes as much as like the general prevailing public opinion is very pro-Israel, and I think that enables a lot of the United States's position. Well, uh, Elysium. I don't think that's the right framework to approach the Israel lobbying in the United States because the lobbying is... When we mention lobbying, we do often refer to, well, that like there's companies or individuals or whatnot, they're putting money into pockets of congressmen and they're bending politics for their favor. That's what we usually think about when it comes to lobbying. But for the Israeli lobby and for actually most lobbies out there, um it's they also have a a pr initiative in getting mm -hmm. public support so a part of like bending the culture and the the, the general public the public in order to be in favor of israel is a part of the israeli lobby it's a part of their their mo of hey we're going to be putting out some advertisements we're going to be hosting these events we're going to be funding these groups that are then going to proliferate our ideas and our message and what we want our strategy of like calling everybody anti-semite that's all part of the israeli lobby yeah so that would be the much bigger part that actually would matter to me about anything um, and then if you're in a fight for public opinion, there's going to be a bunch of um, different things that are playing into that. Yeah. Well, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not interested in like what is more important than the other. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I, so I don't know why it's important for you. Yeah. So Chow made uh, earlier in his opening statement, he made the point about like uh, that, uh, that there is no incentive uh, to push uh, Israel in the right direction. Uh, from from the US or the EU uh would you guys agree with that or uh, or not no um that's something i wanted to bring up too i think this was historically very true um israel was like the one western ally in the middle east but since like relations have normalized for the most part and the threat of middle eastern violence is more centered on iran than um every arab state versus israel um the idea that unrest and violence in Israel is still like um, an acceptable cost or like a um, a beneficial um, trade-off um, becomes less and less true. No, I completely disagree in like your understanding of what's going on in the Middle East. You still have Hezbollah in Lebanon that is still adamantly getting funded by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and they mm -hmm. are continuing to target Israel. And it's like the, the wars between Israel and, and Lebanon it has occurred pretty recently, and it's it still mm -hmm. continuing to this day. Hezbollah still exists. And you still have Iran that is staunchly against Israel, and you still have Iran trying to get a nuclear weapon and Israel doesn't like that. You, you still have shit going on between Saudi Arabia and, and Israel. Like, yeah, I, it's, it's totally different. Not from, between like, back Saudi then. Arabia and Israel anymore. I, I said yeah, Saudi totally Arabia different. and Iran. 
Oh, so sorry. like the yeah, so like, around, for like, sure. yeah, like you describing it as like, hey, it's not like it was before where there was a coalition of Middle Eastern countries that went against Israel in the beginning of like when when it came to at birth that that was the war. It's it's not it's no longer kind of like that. Yes, you're correct in that there has been some efforts in normalization between I believe the like it was the UAE and Israel and and some other countries starts with a B maybe I forget. Um, but like Bahrain. before the, Bahrain, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but I was right. It started with a B. B. Um, mm-hmm. so, and then like yeah, yes, the, the, these 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 are these are all true events. However, like Israel is still in a very precarious situation in which like its defense is is definitely needed. It's not like we have we don't really have another reliable ally in the Middle East. I think there's a huge difference between defenses are needed and in a precarious situation. I think the era of Israel's um, survivability being questionable is solidly over. Wait, their sur- wait, so like their survival or their like security? Because those two things are different. Both. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You so could, before because you could like survive because you, you could survive with one sure. person left living, right? But that's not okay. ideal. Yep. Well, I think I think Israel's security is no longer under realistic threat. By who? So there's, so maybe maybe I can step into it to kind of kind of square the circle a little bit and just so 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 the question of Israel being um, invaded and annexed by other um, by other Arab countries. So like what what happened in 1948 or 1967 or these kind of major large like army on army conflicts. That seems to be something that's kind of come to an end. Uh, relations are pretty normalized with Egypt, um, but in terms of so, in terms of the way that Israel defines security, that really means um, not having um, attacks, whether they're mortal, mortar attacks or missile attacks or these kind of guerrilla forces. Um, and and that's where I would make the claim that um, all of these things that Israel does in the name of security, such as annexing more and more of the West Bank um, is actually against its own security, um, trying to, um, I don't know if I want to throw out the G word, but um, trying to um, crush a population under your heel um, is not likely to make, make them want to just let you do that. Um, and you will have support from other people who, who relate to that struggle. So when it comes to security, I would say that Israel will not be secure until it stops, um, in, until it starts, let's say, complying with UN resolutions and um, not building new territories, removing territories, giving back land that is illegally occupied. I would say that's, that's when security will come. Can right. I ask a question? Um... Unless, unless you guys want to want to respond to that, but I have a question just regarding that a little bit. So, why do we think? Because the Israeli government is obviously not stupid. If it's um, if it's like part of their, if it's threatening their security interests, why do we think they continue to um, do these settlements? Because they're able to do so without any really risk to their security. Okay, so they settle. What is the consequences of them settling? Like what they have to deal with some some people protesting. Okay, say, okay, all right. Like the real security risk of Israel is not going to be coming from like them doing the settlements or like them doing any sort of human rights violations or whatnot. But it potentially could come from other countries. And like, yes, you know what? I could probably agree in that right now it's a pretty good time in the Middle East. There's not, I, I would say, like relatively relatively in history, not a lot of conflict going on. However, that has nothing to say of what might happen in the future, of what if Iran does get that nuclear weapon? What happens when they do start pointing it at Israel? What happens when they do start making these threats? What happens when like all the these other countries start becoming maybe a bit more extreme? You know, things are I would say I'm pretty confident are bound to change, and that is why even during peacetime you don't see countries disbanding all of their militaries because like oh we're at peace you know we're there's there's okay, there's no threats to us you know we're, we're chill we're chill no like they're still going to pursue these security interests they're still going to want the united states to fund them and you know if, if 
if all if that fundy kind of just like blips then all of a sudden israel's vulnerable all of a sudden they're bound to attacks and you know you know what like it, it may sound really bad but if that's the case and if that's the consequence of the united states and the west not supporting israel then what does that look for us sure I, I mean, if i if i can can quickly um contribute an answer to that as well so the the golan heights and the kind of um, eastern part of the, the West Bank between them and Lebanon, these are important um, kind of geographically strategic areas. So the Golan Heights, um, I've, I've been there. It's like a good vantage point to look out at any more kind of buffer zone you can have. Israel has a really strong air force. So just more land that some army has to cross to get to uh, Tel Aviv or just any kind of like main cities, that gives them a lot more space to to keep kind of Kind of bombing in those those areas, so it it does increase their security to control more more land. Well, it 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 increases their capacity to fight somebody who wants to to fight them, but it also increases how many people um, dislike them, which I would say does not improve their security perspective. Right, but I think it's obvious Israel is willing to accept reduced security in favor of main or, or pushing their one state zionist project um and that's sure. going to be the yeah. driving factor it's not even um, reduced security as I, I said before like what what <laughs> what consequences are they actually going to get from doing these actions very little there's no well, long to security. term the, the they're idea, able to take it <laughs> the, the Wait, idea is so long name, term if name. they actually sorry name go uh, uh, yeah uh, if, they, if the, the the idea that was proposed by socrates was that if, if actually they start long-term uh scaling down uh the um, uh, the settlements uh like really really pushing for peace that peace is, then is achievable that they'll be able to uh, that hamas that hezbollah will lose support that there will no longer be this a strong push in the arab world to destroy israel or at least that it will be weakened no it will lose popular support no that is such uh, a naive that, that way of thinking of I, how these groups react Wait, that and would absolutely think... be true. The problem is neither side. No, that Elysium, Elysium, that. name, name was still chatting. Right, yeah, yeah, name, I left, name, talk, I, I, and I, I want to yeah, so, yeah, like I, I personally, I personally agree that it's perhaps a bit naive, but we have to believe that if goodwill is shown, there is a path to peace. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be, it's just going to be permanent, permanent, permanent war. And that historically, that those things do happen. That there's a that there's a path to peace. One thing, the last thing I want to add is concerning Golan Heights. I, I think uh, geographically, sure, it, it has a strategic value. But I think the most important value that it has is uh, something. Uh, something I read was fifteen percent of the water uh, that flows into Israel uh, originates from the Golan Heights. So that also is a huge strategic. It's uh, a big deal. Import. Yeah. I don't okay, think you guys easy. realize. No, I don't think you guys realize that. Like. No? The problem for a lot of 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 these extremist groups to, towards Israel is isn't that like Israel's doing bad stuff. It's that Israel exists. Just the mere fact that the name is on the map is a problem for them, and their solution is to get it off, is to wipe it out. Okay. But what, what I said Israel, wasn't that those Israel, groups are going to disappear. Israel stopping the settlements isn't going to stop that. Those groups have power because they have popular support. Because people who are not uh, like gung ho extremist terrorists also support those groups. It, and those Israel, people are those who will Hezbollah be swayed not have by, uh, by a peaceful Israel. Hezbollah absolutely has popular support. Yeah. yeah they no. do. What? Yes. Okay. Depends, so, okay. Depends, Hezbollah, depends Hezbollah what is a political party. Has, Hezbollah mm -hmm. is a yeah. is a political party in Lebanon. That's where they're based at. What and, percentage? And what percentage? Palestine. What percentage of of the government is consisting of Hezbollah? Do you know? Okay, okay. I wonder, I wonder, not very I'm big. Very but large. Large. Oh, that's a wonder, majority. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, did I get frozen? I think I did. Yeah. Oh, my Discord fucked. Oh, I still need to update NVIDIA.
it's a okay here he here here he comes um welcome back <laughs> tigers good to be back okay um yeah, you could argue that their popularity is due to other stuff, not necessarily Israel-related sentiment or whatever. But, I mean, Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon amongst the Shia Muslims is extremely popular, regardless of how, how, how involved they are in, in government. Yeah, it's like 80% it's like very positive. Yeah, and, and, I was, was going to say 80. That positivity is really going to do a lot for Hezbollah. Well, I, as an aside, though, like, I don't under, like, saying government in Lebanon feels like an oxymoron, so I, I don't yeah. understand. <laughs> right now, I guess, True. yeah. True. But then, like, even, so if, even if, like, popularity dips, in which, like, if, if this is, this is not, I don't think, realistically going to happen if Israel starts becoming a bit more nicer, because you still have, like, this dogmatic narrative based in history that like has a lot of grievances against Wait, israel like, Chow, like how do you how do you square this with israel normalizing its relationship with the rest of the middle east yes exactly. that exists but that can totally change mm -hmm. okay so, yeah, so like yeah, egypt in particular bahrain, is a great example because bahrain and yes. uae are really important yeah, well, no, Egypt. That's why. That's why we bring Egypt to the border. Who they fought the driver. Yeah, like the driver of the initial yeah. wars is now and a like peace it's, with it's Israel. and it's what it's like a memorandum of like recognition or something, right? That's that's oh, that's the, that's the okay, whole the mind. peace treaty that that Trump was was okay. It it, it means like very little. No, it's okay. It's at the at the economic... end of the day, at the end of the day, <laughs> Hezbollah is still going to get Hezbollah is still going to get arms and support from Iran. And at, the end of, and at the end of the day, Hezbollah is still going to be antagonistic against Israel, regardless but if why? they have popular because support it's or occupied. not. No, okay. I, I guess so, I, I feel like some no, of this no, is kind no, of useless no, 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 because no, no, the bigger no. problem again, is again, that again, the of issue is that like, peace. okay, okay, Israel is occupying Palestine, okay? There are two ways yeah. to think about it. Is it is the problem the new settlements or is it the problem of like just Israel existing in the first place? You think it has something to do with the new settlements in which that is a very, very small portion as to why people in that area don't like Israel. They just don't yeah, like I would Israel. Say the occupation 100%. probably plays a bit more of a role than just the settlements. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so that, like we went from 100% hate to like 99% hate because, you know, just, you know, cool. they stopped settlements. Okay, awesome. Jay Chow. Like, yeah, you're missing the bigger picture here. Okay. Would you mind if I if I stepped through some some of these basic because there's no I, I think it. each one of these is, is totally okay. <laughs> I think I think each one of these is, no. is very he asked me, um, I said no. No, he okay, can do well, it. He I'm can do kidding. it. I'm Go ahead. I'm just meta game. Well, <laughs> um, so I think there's um, so so first of all, there's there's just kind of like a basic um, concept that I really really personally want to hammer hard, which is um, separating out when we talk about this word security into these two different things of like security of like the existence of the state of Israel and security in terms of like a day to day kind of feeling of safety safety from like mortar attacks and knife attacks and, and bus bombing, stuff like that. So the more of the kind of um, like the kind of personal security versus like state security. I, I would say that this, the state security is very, is very strong. And I would say that the kind of personal security is very compromised whenever um, there's a perception that Israel is um, massively, massively abusing human rights. Um, and to connect these things can be can be very complicated, but I would say breaking these up is, is very important. Um, but going back to the the founding of of Israel, and wait, I've, hold on, I've hold on, wait, at... wait, 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 wait. You just oh, made okay. you just made a distinction, and then you just left mm -hmm. it there. Okay, are you leading up to oh, it? I, I it thought you didn't want to like step through, right. but if you want to step through, I would love that. What is the point of this distinction? Besides that, so, it's important. So the distinction is is that um, different um, events and attitudes will be affected regarding these things differently. So um, Egypt, for example, um, as a state, which originally invaded Israel, is now like normalized relations. And they're, they're not, there's no, in, there's no indication that they're going to try to invade, that they're going to send their army across the Sinai to try to invade and like destroy Israel. There's no indication that that's going to happen from them. I don't know actually when it comes to um, what what groups that might carry out attacks 
kind of like ter more terrorist style attacks within Israel that that might be harbored within Egypt. I don't know about that. It's, it's possible something like that occurs. But separating separating those two things out, I think is actually critical for, for understanding these. I feel like these are things that are affected in very, very different ways. So Iran is supporting um, Hezbollah and, and Hamas, I believe. Um, and they carry out um, both those kind of more like wars and more kind of like guerrilla terrorist attacks. And um, Iran doesn't doesn't like Israel. Maybe that's not something that's going to change no matter what Israel does to kind of like give back land, anything like that. So when it comes to those things, they might be pretty aligned. Um, when it comes to support for terrorist acts in Israel from local populations in um, Gaza and West Bank, if Israel starts giving back land, stops building settlements in like a very like clear, decisive way, I would expect that support locally for terrorist actions will, um, if not evaporate, will de decrease. I would say it, it probably wouldn't increase. Um, and But that's a different kind of security than Iran might keep as a country pushing to try to do things to undermine Israel. So did I, uh, did I do a good job of trying to justify whether that distinction is, is like useful? Yeah, sure. I just don't think it's useful. Okay. <laughs> um, and like, and, and not the, sure how to parse that. The, the reason Damn. why the the reason why though, um, is that it, it's very hard to I guess like see the day to day and change the day to day when we rarely do know like what what are going to be the consequences of like I guess short term actions. You know, the day tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. You know what I mean? So like that's that's kind of um, why you, you I don't I think when it comes to security I don't think I do you so have to see in, in the big picture. Okay. It, I think it's very difficult to like put responsibility onto a particular action when you're looking at it on the day to day. Put to put responsibility on a particular action because of a specific previous action. It's very hard to make that kind of a connection. And it's also very hard to to see any sort of trends in that like Perhaps that is just a once in a while kind of a thing. It's also you have to consider in that like there were times I'm I want to I'm I'm confident to say that there are times in which Israel was really relaxed on settlements and maybe even a time in which they didn't have any settlements and yet this still persists. So like I th I think I, I want to say it beyond just settlements. We're not trying to find one specific action, but like a more macro trend. So if settlements stopped if rights were given to Palestinians, if occupation was found a solution for and stuff like this, like all of these things would be taken together, not just you know, like the we macro do trend one X is thing that despite, and everything there are despite countries that you guys keep on mentioning are normalizing relations with Israel, in which I kind of just see that as complete BS. Um, they, they, they just aren't interested in uh, wanting the fight. So they might as well just, okay, well, let's just say we normalize. Okay, get it out of the way. Um, despite these things, occurring in which you guys think are, is so important hezbollah still exists hezbollah is still getting stronger day after day what is and like and, those are two different groups if if what, you normalize your relationship what, with the saudis and the iranian people aren't your friends now it's not like you didn't make a new friend i'm sorry it's just that was very absurd i don't understand wait i don't understand you. yeah obviously like I, I think hamas hamas and hezbollah are, are two different creatures uh, because wait, of the, not, like, I, the, I didn't mention hamas I, I know, did, I'm I talking did. So about I, it. I, I think it's okay. Okay. Name, Who are you responding to? And so I think it's just funny to make this and then Chow, move the conversation, can... okay? Um like I, I agree with you, Chao, that like I, Iran Iran perceives Israel uh, seems to perceive Israel as a as an existential threat. Uh, they don't care about settlements. They don't care about Israel treating pa Palestinians better. They care about Israel existing. Uh, they have said that out outright, at least the parties that are in power. Um however, I think with uh, with Hamas there have there has been historically at times not with Hamas but with Palestine there have been times where Israel and Palestine were more much closer to peace. Now the issue there and where I agree with you where where it's easy to perceive it as naive is that peace and dialogue it takes both sides. It, it just Israel de-escalating is never going to be enough to fix the situation. There the de-escalation de needs to be recognized and respected by the other side and the other side needs to also de-escalate and I don't know how that can happen either.
to like okay yeah uh, can we can we look back i feel like a bunch of this is like super weird because we're talking about like a situation where either side is trying to de-escalate or either side wants peace when that just doesn't feel like reality like yes and it's also sides... not reality that like oh israel should do this because then all of a sudden it's going to become a bit more secure no that's not the case so okay um let me let me see if i can so so you gave me kind of a difficult task which is you said it's it's difficult to draw you know correlation from like you know the the policies of one country and events that occur later that it is difficult it is always difficult yet i believe that there are some things that we we can draw some at least um maybe soft conclusions so the the poverty rate in gaza is estimated like 50 to 80 percent um they don't really have like um, consistent power or water um, buildings are constantly being demolished and they're um, they're blockaded so they can't get building materials um, would you would you grant that a, a population that is in a state like this is more likely to carry out terrorist acts than one that does have food and water and kind of the basic fun functioning of society of jobs um i don't i don't know if that's something that you think seems reasonable yeah i probably yeah. should give a uh, name it a bit more credit for his point that like hamas uh, from what i've been seeing on the headlines hamas seems like they act in response to certain actions committed by israel and then there's kind of like maybe a cause and effect going on between the two over there so Hamas may be a bit more responsive and maybe a bit more uh, going along with your dynamic of, hey, if, if Israel just like acted better, then maybe they, they wouldn't get like all, the, all this shit from Hamas. Now, the problem is that any shit that Israel does get from Hamas gets blown by the Iron Dome. And so then to Israel, and I, I think this, this, they've kind of made the, this decision. In that, hey, we are simultaneously going to pursue our one state solution for us and not for other people. Continuing this, we're going to mitigate the consequences to the point where they just don't exist. It's like, okay, sure, um, some rockets land in, in in our cities and some people get, die, get injured. Okay, now let's just, let's use that into our propaganda into and, and like get us get us more mm -hmm. support and like here's this. So it's like it's really sure. difficult for me to see how there's any sort of incentive for Israel to pursue them not like getting not continuing their settlements. It's like I I don't like it. I I, I want to make that abundantly clear. But like when it comes to thinking about like, hey, there's this country they have goals. We want to change that. Well, how or how how can you actually change their behavior if you're not even willing to accept that? Like, hey, these are their goals. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I honestly agree with with pretty much everything that you said. If we if we pull it back though to say the U.S., where we're not beholden to, I, I mean, there there are those kind of r like radical Christian groups in the U.S. that want um, Israel to like take over the Middle East so that there'll be like like doomsday and then like the Messiah will come. <laughs> Other than that element in the U.S., that's not our our goal um, for for the region in particular. We don't we don't specifically care about like settlements in particular or anything like that in, in the US. Um, is there a reason uh, or oh, okay, there are reasons that we support Israel, but I think that there there are a lot of moves that we could make in in other countries in Europe and in the US to to push against this. And because um, the US in particular, we do spend um, I don't know what it is at this point, $5 billion a year, $20 billion a year in terms of um, security aid. Um, I, I would say that we have, have some leverage and, and given the fact that we're, we're close allies, I guess, depending on how you look at our relations at a, at a given time, you know, we have, we have this connection to, to Israel. I, I think that we could put some pressure to do the right thing. Okay. Then I want to bring it back to what Elysium and Name said. Uh, Elysium said in his opening statement that we should uh, 
more approaches more neutral in a sense uh, so and then name was more about like uh, uh, pushing uh, Israel in the in the right direction um, so Elysium what what's this whole thing about like having more of like a neutral way of engaging um, I mean, it's like dialogue of how do you push Israel in the right direction? People think that we should be like condemning Israel and cutting off all aid and stuff like this, and it's just like an insane departure of what we currently have. Like, if mm-hmm. we have to propose realistic situations where, um, and and like Socrates mentioned this, maybe the idea of um, America abstaining on more UN votes and letting the international community apply pressure on Israel is something that can show them that they don't have. Um, the leeway to do all the things they want and things like that. Okay. Name? Um, I don't know if the UN stuff matters that much. I mean, I, I've, I've seen like a UN, uh, UN Human Rights Council report saying that, uh, uh, like arguing that Israel is an apartheid state. And mm-hmm. the, the, the responses to that pretty much were like UNHRC is anti-Semitic. Uh, so like I I don't know how to how, how, I I know how much the like UN resolutions even matter in the in the grand scheme of things. I I do think that um like what I was thinking of was not not even not like pressuring hard because I I think we do have to be realistic about the importance that Israel has in the in like Western influence in the Middle East etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But like U.S. diplomats. I think absolutely can, uh, when they have their discussions with the Israeli diplomats, be like, "Hey, this this looks bad. Like we 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 gotta like we gotta do things better." You of course you have your security concerns. You you have to defend yourself against attacks, etc. But there there are, like there are better ways of doing this. We we would we need you to keep like this the like crazy Zionist shit under control, and and then uh, like and then it will be much more politically palatable. That's that's kind of what I was arguing for. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah, then uh, Socrates also brought up like one other point uh, about like uh, the Jerusalem. Jerusalem. You want to respond? Really? Yeah, I don't think a state okay. being classified as an apartheid country, or, or um, it gets it gets super awkward when you add like occupation to it for like the national level and stuff. But like. I don't think that has zero repercussions. I think we can like look at how did the UN react to um, South Africa and mm-hmm. how um, if the UN is as a body going to start pushing for things like um, embargoes of um, certain goods and, and defense and military equipment to an apartheid country as like a general principle that, that the United Nations upholds and America is moving away from being a veto blocker um, that represents a real concern to Israel um, that's not instigated by America, but it's not being protected by America. And I like, think that's like more of a, yeah. Elysium, you do realize that the United Nations doesn't like really make a decision as a body. Like it's an independent thing. I, I don't know what that means. Okay. So the United Nations is... I want to say, like, uh, describe more as, like, a community of countries that come together and they can yeah. make decisions. So um, if, like, if the United States is going to be there to veto any sort of UNSC resolution, um, they can't do that in the General Assembly. Because okay, wait, I think I can, I can just, like, bridge this. I, yeah, even if the United States doesn't sign on to an arms embargo to Jerusalem, if other countries do, and the United States seems to be one of the only countries that is yeah, willing that be to the UN. not sign on to something like that. Yeah, but these resolutions come from the UN that everyone signs on to. I, and if they're, like vetoed, and if they're vetoed, then it's no longer a, a UN. Or it is a UN well, thing. I it's just a said if UN the United thing. States doesn't veto it. <laughs> okay, and how realistic is that? I, it could it could change like with our well not our with our hearts and minds, right, Socrates? President, probably, but right? maybe the president. We're gonna get, we're gonna get Bernie <laughs> Sanders elected. And everything's going to change, okay? It's like no, the avatars. The no, I don't calling... think you would okay, be that wait, tough wait, wait, on Israel, wait, wait, unfortunately. And I understand what you mean now. The idea of calling a country an apartheid state and anti-democratic and, you know, actively discriminating on people that it has, like, um, the responsibility to be protecting and stuff, like, 
this is the rhetoric that changes the public opinion within a country that values democratic um, liberties, civil liberties and stuff that could move the political atmosphere of the United States to abstain from things that it normally vetoes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't think calling calling a country an apartheid state is not meaningless to me. That I think that will carry you a lot of public weight. That is a big distinction. Yeah, yeah I, how, I how's that going right now, though? Yeah, because er earlier you mentioned South Africa, like the well, the other well-known apartheid state, and yeah, South Africa got a bunch of sanctions on it, etc. Do you actually think that uh, the the U.S. will lead like a a, a, a collective? united front of grand sanctions against israel just because nope. the un po like posted a report on them that's, that's not, not going to happen not lead that's what i'm saying i'm not trying to get the us to lead anything someone else in the rest of the entire fucking world can figure out how to lead stuff besides the united states but the united states can be moved off of its blocking role i think that's what the goal and they can, they can lead sanctions without the united states in that case without the un, UN resolution they they can still do it. Yeah, you could do little, you know, lateral they sanctions. Could. Yeah, and you can find other buddies to do the sanctions with, like go through your own diplomatic channels. Yeah, and then once you do, then well, you're gonna have to mess with the United States because they're not going to like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I remember that in the Netherlands, there there was like some. Uh, I don't know what actually happened to it, but. I remember there was like a push for recognizing like Palestine overall. Um, so yeah, it can be done like with the US, but obviously like uh, like the more the barrier, the better, right? In, in the sense of what you want to do. Um, that being said, like uh, I want to go to one point that um, uh, Socrates was bringing up about like moving the embassy. Um, so um, my question around that would be would it be useful to move it back to Tel Aviv or something like that or is that just uh, already like a done deal so um, Socrates yeah I, I mean I think um, a huge amount of the harm has has been done and I, I don't know how much um, right so if you if you move your embassy once to Jerusalem, that's a very bold, decisive move. If you move it back, now it just seems like, uh, fuck, USA is a democracy. They get, they go in a new direction every four years. So that it doesn't mean anything. Um, so moving it back, I think would would help. But I, I think so much of the damage has already been done as a result of of have, having done that at all. I, I don't know what other people think about that. I mean, it definitely I, I, doesn't I think carry it's more symbolic. Weight. Um, but yeah, I think that I, I think moving back to Tel Aviv still carries some value. I think it's mm -hmm. like I think it's been pretty clear for a while that America has destroyed its like ability to be a neutral arbiter in the situation. So I don't think that's ever going to come back. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't I don't yeah, you're not going to like restore that role um, okay. anytime soon, no matter what you okay. do. Okay, Levin. Um, well, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a big uh, supporter of a one-state solution. So ultimately, mm. I think uh, Jerusalem should should belong to whoever. And um, the embassy, the question of the embassy is just whatever the capital is. If it's Jerusalem, the, the embassy should be there. I think it's kind of weird to have this like symbolism, like where the embassies are. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's my uh, that's my hot take. Okay, I mean, I I don't know. I I think I think there's some real um, there's some real weight behind it. You know, like if um, uh, just uh, hypothetically, if like um, the U.S. recognized Russia's capital being like Kiev or something, you know, like there's th th there's a there's a real impact of of what we're saying behind that that we're recognizing a certain kind of political or geopolitical reality behind that. Um, I'm interested to hear more about your, your thoughts on one state, but I, I don't know if we have other questions about that, so we don't have to. No, we should just go to that because it's dumb. <laughs> okay, uh, don't say it's dumb, Elysium. We'll do that. Um, Come on, bro. So, but uh, yeah, we can move on to that because that is actually the the second topic that we wanted to address. Perfect. When it comes to uh, like the whole uh, ordeal, what would be like a, a 
have a good outcome uh, when it comes to this whole thing, yeah. complicated stuff, right? Um, uh, and that being said, like, uh, yeah, basically the question is, well, what would you see as a solution? The one state, two states, ten states, zero states, how many states? No ten states. states. Sorry. So, um, yeah, so I will give everybody the opportunity to, to do opening statements uh, on this one. And uh, let's start off with Jay Chao. Yeah, so the two state and one state solution kind of a debate is riddled with each side calling each other unrealistic. The fact of the matter is that both are unrealistic. Any sort of solution to Israel Palestine is unrealistic because it assumes that both sides are actually going to come together, agree on things, and live happily ever after afterwards. Uh, with how things are going right now and what what each side believes in, I do not believe there's any sort of solution. However, if one person were to like you know threaten me, I I, I had to give a take. Uh, I think I would prefer the two state solution, and the reason why is because. I don't trust in the one state solution to actually be equitable to all groups of people. So like even if Israel were to become a one state solution and um and there's one government, it's democratic, there's going to be a majority and there's going to be sides. There's going to be partisanship that is going to lean towards one side over the other. And uh I, I think that side is going to be the Jewish side. And so then when it comes to like the, the the one state government kind of like evenly being responsible for the safety and the well-being of everybody, I just I don't trust that. I, I don't trust that for for the Palestinian people. Um, I don't think the Palestinians themselves trust it. Um, I, I think that's why historically they've been more so supportive of the two state solution because they want to fend for themselves and they also want well, they also want self-determination. So I think of those two solutions, the two-state one is the best one. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's go up to uh, Socrates. Sure. So, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, what Jay Chow said, that um, so much of one state versus two state is uh, calling each other unrealistic for supporting them and saying, no, mine is the realistic, yours is, un is pie in the sky. Um, I mean, my um, I don't have any... Um, like expertise on what it it should be. My understanding is that there's more support for a two state solution. Um, the The issue with a one state solution is you have just this this question of um, citizenship and voting. So if you have one state, um, the um, kind of Israeli Jewish population will be concerned that they will get outvoted, that they'll get outpopulated and outvoted. Um, and they, they won't want to give up that kind of legislative control. Um, and so the consequences would be some kind of degradation of the, the rights of um, non-current Israelis um, or, or non-Jews or something like that. Um, and a two-state sidesteps this so you can have um, Israel with um, maybe even similar borders to what it has now, and then a new Palestinian country that is Gaza and the West Bank with some kind of corridor or even like highway connecting them. Um, that's what, what seems to be um, kind of um, common. That's, um, you know, you can have some kind of, so um, uh, UN resolution, I think 242 calls for um, an actual method to um, give back land, which is that so you can't just uproot all the settlements. But what you can do is you can um, swap um, an amount of land back. So you have like some line and you have, you know, pushing, pushing in one direction. I can't really show this with my hands. Pushing in one direction on a line <laughs> and you push back in the other direction um, and kind of scoop out areas of territory to kind of equalize the actual area of land, even though you have this, the settlements remaining. So there are possibilities like this. Um, it seems like it's it's like practically possible. It's just politically mm -hmm. difficult. Okay. And then next up, uh, let's go to Elysium. Um, yeah. The this like uh, I don't know, era of 
ethnic countries and stuff all feels like it is like long past now um the idea that israel can't be expected to be a multicultural country that has civil rights in the long run um i don't think is like is, is just not appealing to me um and currently i describe like we have like a 1.5 state solution we have like a de facto west bank and gaza strip that are um occupied and their own like territories but are occupied by israel and israel's not going to like give that up um anytime soon so the idea that we're going to get two states out of this instead of israel just perpetually occupying palestine for the rest of time um doesn't feel very plausible um so in lieu of that i'd rather have a, a one state solution um and on top of that there's kind of like a um i don't know if we can get into it here but like we can just axiomatically um i prefer civil dispute versus like military dispute um i think we have a lot of examples of how to to perform civil disobedience um or protest for civil rights um and things like this if you have a unified country or a unified group of civil rights for um a people and stuff like that um okay so i think yeah go okay uh then name yeah, I I understand the sentiment of wanting to uh, like like what Elysium described of wanting to have um like a multicultural one state solution, uh liberal democracy, blah blah blah, all that. Uh now the reality is uh we're looking at two people who have been murdering each other for pretty soon nearly a century. Um there is bad blood on both sides. There is absolutely no trust on either side that the other side will act in good faith for everyone's interests. I, I think for now, a one-state solution is a pipe dream. I, I don't see how it can happen because, or if, if it does happen, it will happen through the abject oppression of the other side because the other side will not uh, consent to it. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, the two-state solution, as we've seen for the past, well, almost 100 years, is a shit show. Uh, it, it's still people killing each other. Uh, I don't... But it, it is the status quo, and, and, for, and status quo is easier than, uh, than changing things. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I want to see like a realistic plan to restore trust between Palestinians and Israelis. If we have that, then sure, we can discuss how how to get to one state solution. If we don't have that, I I don't think it's it's possible. Okay, I'd and love to see it though. Sorry. Let's go to Lebanese. Yeah. So I mean, my uh, my support of the one state solution. I mean, obviously, we're Twitch streamers. Okay, we're not gonna solve it right now. But I I I am more a supporter of the one state solution because I think it's really. It's really difficult to have a weak, broken up country and having your enemy basically on your border. Um, and that's not that's not a sustainable way. Uh, it's gonna like keep keep fueling uh, conflict in the area. Of course, I don't think there are some Zionists that believe that Israel should be a one state um, and it should just be Israel and the Palestinians live under Israeli rule. That's not how I see it. Um, I see, ideally, the situation would be that you have um, equal representation between the Palestinian side and the Israeli side within one country, um, whether you want to call it Israel or Palestine or, um, I don't know, something third that's irrelevant, but just having some kind of like common country um, with representation from both sides or three sides, depending if you want to include the Christians in that too. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Two separate <laughs> countries warring at each other, but if it was one country and it was a civil war, I don't think there's much difference between the two. You get what I'm saying? Because like, if there's yeah, going to be a one-state solution, but like, there's still that strife that Naaman was talking about, and they're still going to be fighting each other, yeah, I, I don't think that's going like the one-state solution is any better when it comes yeah. to like conflict. The the a prerequisite I would argue to a two state solution would be that there is actually some form of peace and reconciliation, and that's probably the biggest mm -hmm. reason why I think it is equally unrealistic for a two state solution to occur. But it's something that I would prefer much more for the arguments that I made before. Yeah, no, right I there. totally get, I to I totally uh, I I get, I get your point, 
um, my, my point is not that this is what I want to see happen right now, but this is rather a goal that Palestinians and Israelis um, and Middle Easterners in general, because this is affecting all of us, right, um, should be working towards. That's like the ideal, um, ideal situation, I think. Okay, yeah, Socrates. and um, I, I guess oh. I can't argue against that. It's ideals. Yeah, Socrates. Yeah, so this question of um, so so first of all, one one thing that gets resolved um, um, pretty trivially, assuming that the kind of borders and control are are really like just defined as two sovereign states. One thing that the two states makes very simple is a question of like building permits. This is currently, in my understanding, a thing that's kind of a, a big issue right now of Palestinians living in Israel being denied building permits. And I, I would assume that there'd be a fear that that kind of um, uh, unequal treatment under the same state would continue. Um, but I, I think that the big thing kind of from the, the, the Israeli side um, is that question of, well, if everybody gets a vote, what if it turns out there's like uh, a lot more like Arab or Muslim or Palestinian people just in this country than you know, do they just like vote out vote out the Jews? I mean, I don't think um, like current current iteration of Israel is going to accept uh, a situation where that's even like a remote possibility. Do you want to respond to that, Lennon? Uh, sorry, I totally, I totally didn't hear that. I'm so sorry. Whoa, it's okay. <laughs> My chat. <laughs> um... I'm, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Socrates, for that. I'm sorry. I'm, it's I'm okay. Sorry. It's I'm, okay. I'm, as a as a guest, you know, on, on the show, I'm, I'm so just being ignored. So, anybody else wants to uh, respond to that? Uh, I mean, I think your your like your kind of quasi solution for that is to have a strong civil liberties in your in your laws. Mm. Um, and to take, you know, to change your civil liberties requires typically much more than a majority. Um, and to have like a robust judicial system to then defend those civil liberties for both sides. Um, yeah. But so, I mean, yeah. it, so I'd be I'd be happy to repeat that because I did actually want to hear Lumini's thoughts on that. Um, if yeah, you're, go for it. I don't know, no, you know, if your chat's uh, got some cool, some cool copy pasta. Or, um, so so the question is like, there's this big issue of just um, I, I feel like Israel, if you could kind of like essentialize the psychology of Israel right now, the mm -hmm. idea of expanding who gets treated as a citizen and who gets to vote to mm -hmm. include like all Palestinians and maybe even like some kind of right of return um, and allowing for population growth, not controlling building permits, then there's, it seems like there'd be this fear that basically Jews could get outvoted by, by Muslims. And that would feel like kind of the annihilation of Israel itself, if that's, if that could happen. Yeah, I think when it comes to the question of right of return, it's really hard because all the Palestinians that have uh, become refugees after, after Israel's conception, potentially, you could say, um, they have now they're now making up like call. 7 million people or something like that. Mm. Like you can't have them all come back. Um, it, it would be extremely unrealistic. Um, but I mean, I don't know. It's like it's like this this question of like if if a certain population is willing to be the minority or the majority or whatever, like um, I guess. I guess I don't care about that. <laughs> well, you know, but I guess well, here, Israel... let me mm. let me let me let me throw it back to you because I feel mm. like Israel does care about it, and I feel mm. like they care about it enough that they won't accept. Oh, maybe we'll get outvoted, and then you know we, we won't really have like Israel as we so it, you know we'll, we'll just kind of like mm -hmm. kind of give up all control. Really, you know, I, I I don't see that really like happening. Like period. Um, no, so but... I, I was wondering if you had. Yeah. things that you'd heard that were kind of ways of getting around that um i mean the the arguments that i'm i'm like mainly for uh is because what we're what we're trying to do now is not really working right and i know that's not an argument but trying to create a two-state solution hasn't really been successful and having again having your uh enemy by your border is 
is also like hasn't been the best thing for the region i'm thinking like the region as a whole um not just specifically what's happening israel Palestine, because it has ripple effects throughout the 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 like the middle east right um if i have like a a path you could take to make israel slash palestine one country no i mean i i can acknowledge that it's they're both quite unrealistic right they're both really really tough solutions again like jay chow said like yeah it's ideals like what what do i what, what i personally support and am in favor of uh to see in the future it would definitely be the one state solution but um hey, Goosey. how to get there if i if i had that answer i think i would be a politician somewhere <laughs> Yeah, so there was a, a question from somebody in chat that basically asked, like, uh, if there is, like, a two-state solution and, uh, like, Hamas uh, is in power and, and like, uh, in the, one of those states, would that not be raised, uh, would that not raise more concerns for Israel overall? Uh, so would that not incite, like, more conflicts uh, what do you guys think about that? Well, I don't know what's so different about that hypothetical and what we're doing and what's happening right now in which Hamas has a political and military presence in whatever territory that it is in and there's conflict between Hamas and Israel. So then, like, as I said before, for any sort of solution, whether it be one state or two state to actually occur to the, to the likings of the people on this panel, then a part of a prerequisite to reaching that would be some peace and reconciliation and that's what makes it again i'm going to reiterate i said this already and that's what makes it unrealistic because what is the likelihood that there is going to be any sort of a good faith peace and reconciliation from either side when they come to the table if we're looking at things realistically there already essentially is a one-state solution because israel it's not a controls. solution you idiot it's a problem. That's the okay. one state problem. Okay, there is a one state problem. Okay, happy. It's, it's already controls. I everything. mean, like you, you, you say that it's a solution. It's probably just like a mistake that you said that. I, I don't know, but like, it's it's not a solution for one side, and that's what makes yeah, it a problem. Okay. That's that's what makes it a. That's what that was. That's what gets people killed. Okay, uh, Elysium, go ahead. Yeah. No. True. Yeah. Yeah. We can call it a one state problem. Sure. And and. As Socrates has pointed out, even if Israel's Zionist dreams are realized, if they don't also yeah, I love my coincide with the ethnic pushing out of the Palestinian people, then Israel is going to have. Israel feels that having a Palestinian majority vote is unacceptable. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the only, well, like given the current situation, the only way that changes is with israel's takeover of land um that it needs to realize to make a really strong group of civil liberties for its people um and it's probably going to coincide with a lot of ethnic cleansing of people being pushed out and then um in the long run a, a civil disobedience push for civil rights that can then normalize relationships in a few generations later i don't, I don't know okay socrates yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I, I was just going to agree with him agreeing with me um, and say that I, it seems like for Israel to accept a one state, they would come with basically um, things like, well, you know, if, you know, you're, you're a citizen, but you're not like quite a hundred percent a citizen, like you're a, you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel and you're not allowed to, to build a home unless, you know, unless we say that you can and we want to make sure that they're you know, there aren't too many Palestinian families, because if we are going to give you votes, we don't want you to have too many total votes, because then we don't have almost all the votes. Yeah. I guess um, I think that would still be better than what we currently have, though, because what we currently have is that one state solution, essential problem, one state problem. But there is no responsibility for the Israeli government to their occupied citizens, essentially. Um, yeah, so, so I think that would ideally still be we should go through the right direction. cleansing in order to get to a brighter future. Well, I mean, we're yeah, talking no. about like going through racism to get to a better future, but yeah. Okay. Where have I yeah, heard that I, from I, before? I, I don't think I could support that. Yeah. 
I think that's yeah, a, let's just have to be occupied indefinitely for the rest I of time. I think that's a bit out there. I mean, do you do you think that what is currently happening is better than that? Just being in occupied I don't think territory that's where you have that no civil rights. Evil that that we should that we should like take. You know, there there are other necessary evils that I I agree with, but ethnic cleansing is like well, it's like okay, well, you know what? If if Nazi Germany just ended up winning the war and the entire world was just Aryan Germans, then maybe we wouldn't have ethnic conflict. Oh, man, damn. Maybe genocide was the answer to our brighter future. Maybe we could have gotten ba- wow, gay space okay. communism a lot sooner. It's like, that's, that's, I think that's the problem with those kinds of arguments is that you actually never know when acts of extremism, when acts of accelerationism is actually going to yield results. But what you do know is that there are atrocious acts and that the, the immediate consequences and what you and the do know is what's happening right now. And those atrocious acts already happening right now. Okay. Hold on. Okay. So then, so then, so then, so then, so then the current, current atrocities do not justify more I'm, atrocities. Okay. okay. Okay, if you agree, then why did you say it? Well, because I'm not justifying them. I'm saying what is likely, what is most probable to happen and what is the bounds that we can actually play in to to find a long-term solution. It's not the same thing as justifying them. And then, like, what is the likelihood of the long-term solution? Do you have a magical ball in which you say, hey, if you just do these 10 steps, oh, peace in the world. No, you can't say that. I am not. But I, I don't understand but you're how you're proposing we could a long term same... solution. So how can you at so how can you propose this long term solution without being confident that there is actually a solution at the end? Because okay, the current it, it, yeah. situation is just as bad, if not worse. And I just but you just agree with me that a current situation being bad doesn't justify something even worse that we have to commit. And... I'm, I'm so not are sure. you now okay. disagreeing with sure yourself like what, like, what, I'm not what is sure going what you're on meaning by justify i'm not you, you're not like saying this is ideal or good you're just saying what is elysium, better than okay, the bad elysium, thing there's that a currently trolley exists. cart that's what a, i mean by justify elysium, there's a trolley cart and yeah 100 people have already died now do you want to kill more people just because we're already in a bad situation or or do, do you want to like kind of think, hey, may, maybe be a little bit more idealistic? I, I think right now I would want you to be just a little bit more idealistic than to be like, yeah, fuck it. Okay, let's just commit atrocious acts because the ends justify the means. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so far out of the loop at this point. What's the, what's the act that we're talking about committing to try to... Get, except get being, well. except it, it, the Zionist is like fight. yeah let's let's accept the Zionist Israel let's actually allow them to commit the the oh, ethnic cleansing that they are all the way to the extreme to the point where they are adequately a one state a perfect Jewish state and then maybe in a couple of generations maybe like the hearts and minds of Israelis would change and be like hey you know what maybe we want to be multicultural you know maybe we want to like include other people it's like yeah good good fucking shot yeah, okay. I don't like that idea. Even okay, but okay. How, how uh, even if we had our Zionist one state, do you think that we'd be better for the Palestinians living in occupied lands? The or worse? Palestinians wouldn't exist under a Zionist Israel. Do you think there's the gonna map. be a genocide? What do you mean? You you just mentioned ethnic cleansing. Yeah. Okay. And, do you know what okay, that fine. is? Okay. Right. 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 Maybe I should say ethnic displacement. Are you happy? Holy shit! Right. Like that makes it any better. Okay. I, no, I'm name not it, saying name it. it. Name it. You got this. Better, Come on, but... jump in, please. I can't do it. I, I can't be the only one dealing with this. Okay, you, 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 can't, you can't drive a nuance between uh, ethnic displacement and ethnic cleansing. This, this is something you've seen which in is, like race realism. Which is debates. why I call it ethnic cleansing. And it's yes. only because you are equating that to has to mean murdering you don't, every you single person you when you're realize. not agreeing that ethnic cleansing can be just displacing an ethnic minority too or denying them civil rights. Yeah, and so, being let's, so let's just move them out and then be like, okay, awesome. Where, where are like, they going to go? Okay, okay. Let, let, let's, let's just say uh, instead of calling like ethnic cleansing and displacing, like what we're talking about is, is state sanctioned violence against minorities. There are atrocities. Sure. There, are, there are atrocities under the Rome statute in which you get prosecuted at the International Criminal Court. And if you're not part of the International Criminal Court, you don't really care about that, do you? <laughs> So I wanna, well, I'm I wanna saying let, is I the current wanna, situation is way worse. No, I just want to I want to let name in to respond to this and uh, all just take 
Breathe in, breathe out, guys. <laughs> breathe Everybody breathe uh, re relax no, no, a little no, bit. Man, Come on. The Jews back hey, in you, 1930s you Germany should have been like, you know what? The situation is really bad. Ciao. Hitler might as well Ciao, just you pull Ciao, the, you push the lever, okay? Ciao. You get to okay. the button. Ciao. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to give it to a name. And then I will give it after that. It's Lebanese. And then uh, you guys uh, can return with Elysium and Ciao. Uh, to the blood sports that you guys are used to so uh yeah so let's go to name and then lemonese yeah blood um, no interruptions mine mine's the blood sports i do tend to i i i do tend to agree with like uh Ch chow here or, or maybe i've misunderstood your point elysium but uh if i've understood correctly i i agree with chow here um speed is i don't know the only thing i want to say actually is is a stupid meme uh Speaking of like uh, how how the Jewish people should have reacted during World War Two, I I find it hilarious that the a member of uh, Netanyahu's party was talking about deporting uh, like immigrant workers in trains to camps before deporting them. Sorry, what? that's that's my contribution to that. Okay, it's not a contribution. No, 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 no. Lemon, go ahead. I feel like I started something horrible here. Um... <laughs> Yeah, that's Wait, why. That's what? why I asked you. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think, I think, what do I think? Meditate. Um, I can see both points. Okay, <laughs> let's let's chill. Um, a what? I don't know. I don't know what else I can add other than what I said. I mean, I can see Chow's point that it's really unrealistic. But I mean, my point is not is not based on basically my point is it's something we as middle easterners should strive towards having um a peaceful a calm a based a chill hummus filled palestine slash israel um that is one state that's wow. it um how to get there is a whole different issue but how to get to a two-state solution with Jerusalem being like a part of neither is also like how do you even get there also um yeah well I wouldn't be advocating for apartheid nor ethnic cleansing in order to ask no, them, like, a step, as, as steps to those solutions me neither. so then like okay well Lebanese when it comes to your support for a one-state solution if it could only occur by accelerating ethnic cleansing, would you still support it? No. Okay. All right. Okay. I think uh, I think we probably we can. Um, I think it might be good to do like uh, ending or closing statements on this one, and then we also we still got one more topic as well. So uh, I think it might be interesting to do that. So ending or closing statements means no interruptions, so everybody can say their their piece on this one and we're gonna move on to the next topic which is also about israel um so uh, let's start off with uh name okay um my stance hasn't really budged much um i uh, in an ideal perfect world where the human beings on on, on both sides uh, can could like move past all the years and years of violence a uh, one-state solution would be better. I, I'm usually for people gathering together in bigger and bigger groups and working together and treating each other well and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in this specific case, I it's incremental progress is the name of the game. There there needs to, there need to be small shows of good faith, um, small demonstrations that de-escalation is possible. Not even peace, just de-escalation. Less less attacks from uh from uh the palestinian hamas side uh less maybe less retaliation from israel or or like more less oppressive uh acts from israel and and it has to start somewhere and if you if you tell israelis that it has to start from them they'll they'll remind you that they're under attack from uh, that there there is an existential threat to their uh, to their lives and to their country if you tell that to palestinians they'll tell you the same thing that they're under attack that there is an existential threat to their people and to their country and it's and it, and like several times in history both sides have uh, perhaps done the first step and if the other party doesn't 
follow through with their own step, then it all breaks apart, and then there's even more bad blood. So I don't know. Like I uh, like I think Chao's description is astute. Uh, a one-state solution isn't realistic at the moment, and a two-state solution isn't functional. But uh, it's kind of what's happening right now, and we see it's and it's a shit show. That's that's okay. what I have to say. Then let's go to Illusion. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I guess. Okay. How do we summarize? Um, I don't see any successful two-state solution coming out because neither side wants peace right now. I feel like I've tried to write that a few times. Um, Israel has a bunch more agency than the Palestinians right now, but they obviously don't want peace and they want to continue their Zionist project and the current security costs are worth it. If we could normalize relationships with Iran and um, then apply more pressure on them through other means and stuff, you know, yeah, getting a wonderful world or if, you know, to name it, if everyone just wants to you know, be nice and find put let bygones be bygones and be peaceful now. Yeah, that'd be super great too. I don't see any of these things happening. I would put more um, onus on Israel because they have more agency over the situation. But living in a one-state problem is bad. Living under permanent occupation is bad. Living under the current apartheid and ethnic cleansing is bad. So the idea that like to find a way forward, I think it would be better for these people who are currently living under these things to live under the same conditions, but under a government that has more responsibility to their civil rights, um, which I was also think is probably the most realistic outcome because that's what Israel wants to do and Israel has the agency and uh, wherewithal to do it right now. Okay, and then next up, Levin. Yeah, I uh, mostly agree with the uh, name and with Elysium. Um, there are ideals <laughs> and things you want to strive towards and then there's like what's realistic um and they're both interesting conversations to have there is merit in both of them there you go Poli <laughs> political answer <laughs> you do yeah are you doing the both sides yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i just want to okay friends. okay uh, and then uh, jay chow okay i'll do the same thing ideally if I were God and I could control everybody, all governments, all people, give then... it to the Jews. Okay, for God wants. All right. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. To, to to God's people, which is all people, mm. and including aliens. You know, gay space communism. Okay, peace and love. Uh, no wars, nothing. Okay, yeah. So I, ideally, that would be the best thing, right? But then, uh, when it comes to well, what is realistic? Neither of these, one state nor two state, is realistic. Um, and any sort of person who is like making arguments for one over the other, I think, um, you know, myself included, even, is um, uh, I don't think you guys know what you're talking about. Especially somebody here who believes that you know maybe in a couple hundred years, then things are actually gonna go swell if we stick to one direction. It's like, yeah, damn, I'm gonna be dead in a couple hundred years, and even if that were to occur. Then like, oh, well, Palestinians, I would want Palestinians to live under a government that has more responsibilities. Well, guess what? At that point, Palestinians, Palestinian people just won't exist because of the previous policies of accelerationist ethnic cleansing. And that is like, if that is your path to a one state solution, it's not. It's just a one state problem. But like there are just no more problems because the problem, quote unquote, has disappeared. They have been cleansed. Okay, and then um, Socrates. Sure. Um, so um, I would say that um, if there's anybody out there who's watching who has a, a question of whether there would be a difference between a a one state solution or a two state solution in which Palestinians have some level of sovereignty, um, they Palestinians currently do not have. So five million Palestinians living in West Bank. East Jerusalem and Gaza um, aren't able to vote in Israeli elections despite being controlled. Um, they aren't allowed to build um, uh, current president of Israel as of 2021, um, said that Israel was becoming an apartheid state. Um, Ehud Barak, Israel's former prime minister, said that Israel is becoming an apartheid state. But Selim, the main human rights organization is Israel, has declared um, Israel an apartheid state. Desmond Tutu, um, who was one of the prominent figures in leading South Africa um, out of apartheid, said that um, he feels a lot of parallels to being in apartheid South Africa. Um, 
and the um, settlements that are built on occupied territories have been declared across the world to be illegal, um, including um, uh, an Israeli foreign minister legal counsel said that the settlements are illegal. We shouldn't do that. People aren't going to like it because it's illegal. Um, so there, there really isn't disagreement on whether the settlements are legal. The occupation of the land is illegal. Um, I, I don't like the sentiment that um, anything changing is unreasonable. I think it's just a question of whether the political will exists um, in Israel, in Palestine, in the United States, in Europe, in the Middle East, to um, push for what, what has to happen under international law, which is for Israel to stop building settlements on occupied land and to stop occupying land that was um, uh, taken during, um, during war. Um, those are illegal and it, it just has to give those back. It's just a question of whether the um, international and um, national will can be um, brought to bear to make that happen. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think um, there is a rising, so in the United States, I believe that there is a rising will for the rights of Palestinians to be recognized. Um, and I, I think that that's paramount over whether it's a one state or two state, but um, either way, international law has to be upheld and um, Palestinians have to have rights. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then uh, our next topic uh, is still about Israel, but that being said, like if you are watching the stream, it would be much appreciated if you give one of these people a follow or something more. Uh, so we got Elysium, uh, that's the anime character. We got a J. Chow Life. Uh, it, we got a J. Chow Life, which is next to the anime character VTuber. Uh, then underneath me, we got Lemonese uh, 666. And uh, next to Lemonese, we got Neymanon. And next to uh, Neymanon, we got Socrates TV. So I want to go on please... record saying I don't support racism toward VTubers. So. Oh. Uh, so inclusive so uh, look at this uh, so uh, our next uh, topic is uh, goes as follow special trips that are fully funded by organizations or organizations to push uh, ideology slash id or is basically an ad campaign for something uh, are usually frowned upon what do we think about jewish birthright so uh, I want to give it up uh, to Socrates. You can start up. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I was um, just chatting yesterday with uh, my tour guide, one of my tour guides for my birthright tour. Um, I, so um, what I think about the program overall, I think it's a, a, both a propaganda tool and also a tool to increase the population of Israel, the um, one of the major um, functions of the birthright tours is that um, um, people come from the US and Europe and hang out with Israeli young Israeli soldiers and hopefully <laughs> fall in love and get married and move to Israel. This Space. this does happen. Uh, um, so um, I guess I guess that's fine. The propaganda is not good. I was on a food tour, so there was a little bit less kind of overt propaganda. Um, for me personally, coming in already, having formed an opinion on, on Israel, um, it was very useful for me to see, like, personally what things were like on the ground, to see, uh, to see the wall, to see um, what things looked like. I saw um, Gaza through... A, chain link fence um it was actually very very close the like it was a border settlement that the tour guide's brother was at where they don't usually go there and they said that um there's like air raid alarms that go off and sometimes you have like you know a few minutes before like the bombs fall or sometimes you have like not that long and they said in this area sometimes the air raid alarm doesn't go off until after the bombs have started landing um so it was a scary Scary place to be, scary place to, to see the, all of the bomb shelters everywhere. It gives you some understanding of what it's like for Israelis to live there. 
um, yeah. and to, to try to understand that, that psychology a little bit more. Um, so I personally didn't feel like I was super um, swayed by being there that, oh, you know, it's just like uh, nice food and some of the people are nice and therefore I support the government. Um, but I know that a lot of people are. So um, I guess that's that's my both sides. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, next, Lebanese. Oh, and the hummus sucked. <laughs> what sucked? The hummus. The hummus. <laughs> what? The best, the best hummus I had was on the flight over. I'm serious. Oh. It was, it was, yeah, they it was, it the I don't right know. places, I think, no? Uh, yeah, okay. I'm not sure. I had really good Arab food there, but it was really this sounds uh, these steaks are too hot, you know. The hummus yeah, food. that <laughs> sounds like I don't know. That's <laughs> not gonna lie. Airplane food is actually pretty good. I don't know why I get so much hate. Chinchilla, can you host the airplane food panel one day? That'd be pretty, pretty good. Uh, it really <laughs> depends on the on the the flight. Uh, the the how you call it. The... Oh man, the worst. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, sorry. This is such a tangent. I'm so sorry. Um, I have ADHD. Yeah, did, this this goes off oh, your yeah. opening statement time, by the way. So. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, no, I mean I don't I don't know much about birthright other than what I've been told by other people that have been on it. Um, yeah, it it that's my impression as well. Um, what um Socrates just mentioned that it's kind of like a sort of like a propaganda tool and a and a way to have people move over there. Um, but I also think people just see it as a free trip. Well, at least the, the Jewish people that I've talked to, they see it as like a fun, uh, free trip or whatever. Um, whether or not I think it is good. Um, I, I just, I just don't know like what the impacts of it is. Um, if you, if you see Israel as an occupying country, then it is argued that, you know, it's definitely not a good thing because you're trying to move people over into op- occupied lands. But if you see uh, Israel as just another country, I mean, then it's kind of like irrelevant what birthright is for and what the process and, you know, idea is. That's my uh, take. Okay. Elysium? Um, I don't know how it's possible to not see Israel as an occupying country. And they've been. <laughs> they're like, like they they have occupied lands, um, or they're occupying Palestine. That's like the heart of the problem. <laughs> um, I don't, I, um, the the right of return and and trips um feels like a really cringe policy from like a more cringe um time period uh following World War Two where it made more sense then. Um, I think that's where it was like majoritarily impactful too. I think now it's like our example of like um positive ethnic displacement like they're trying to bring more jews in um to bolster their population and so like in that regard it's just like a um a really cringe immigration policy um that um can be done in a bunch of other ways um but yeah it's all like it's just preferential immigration um treatment and and um i don't know that like becomes much harder to tackle like a policy level if we want to call it like um a a racist policy um or not or just like you know um ethnic or or just you know it doesn't have to be strictly ethnic or just like um country quota immigration style things you could you could achieve the same ends okay then next up jay chow i don't have a lot of heavy feelings or thoughts about the birthright trip uh that Jewish people are able to take, you know, free trip to Israel, I guess, tourism. Um, I agree with the description that it's a propaganda tool. And uh, I don't know if this has been mentioned yet, but it's one of the ways that Israel is, the Israeli government is trying to get its uh, youth, its target youth to support the state of Israel. And um, along with that, support the state of Israel in spite of the atrocities that they commit to other territories and to other groups of people. Um, They want to, their goal is to preserve uh, that sort of sentiment, uh, that the the longevity of the Israeli state. And as if if that is their goal, then I I think what they're doing is a, it would be a a good policy. Um, 
morally speaking though, it's um uh, I think like there are probably bigger problems to condemn Israel for rather than birthright. Uh but birthright is part of the problem. Okay. Uh, and then Neyman? Uh I don't think birthright is that much of an issue. Uh because like if we're talking about indoctrination. We still are talking, of course, adults can be susceptible to indoctrination. We've seen a lot of that in recent years. We're talking about adults going on, on, on those trips. We're not talking about kids like in schools getting taken to military camps, being told that uh, Arab people want to kill them, which is something that happens also in Israel and is a much bigger issue if we're going to talk about uh, like really loaded propaganda. Uh, however, birthright... I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm biased. I haven't done my birthright trip yet, but uh, I'm technically entitled to one, and I really want to do it. I want to get a free trip to Israel. Uh, <laughs> you should do it before you age out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I, wait, what's the age limit? Um, I might shoot, I think it was already. like... Ooh. So I think it's like 26, but I, I think they have tours oh, for I'm too old already, well, so. okay. The, the, that, that, that ship has it's, uh, I think it's, they... It's, oh, wait. it's 30, 32. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was say... my age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Well, so much for that. I don't know. I, I like the. Okay, at the end of the day, uh, countries countries want people to come to them and to live there. Uh, it brings wealth to the country, whether material wealth or intellectual wealth. Uh, those people will add to the value of a country. I, I, I that's that's not a that's not a weird thing. Uh, the propaganda, sure. Um, it, it's a bit cringe, but it, it's really not the worst part. If, if we're going to talk about propaganda, I think there are other things that uh, that happen in Israel that are much, much worse uh, and that actually matter. Okay. Uh, yeah, that being said, like we got somebody over here that had uh, done that trip, right? So, Katiz. So, um, I want to ask your your. I want to ask you then a question about this because of the fact that you said like mm -hmm. I I wasn't influenced by the trip or whatsoever, but that's uh, because I have like prior knowledge about like the the whole um, yeah the, the hey, problems over there, right? Um, would you say that if you uh, didn't know that that you could have been influenced uh, a lot more? Oh yeah, for sure, and I, I wouldn't say that I wasn't influenced at all. But I, I would say that I had, um, I already had decided that you know the, the Israel was like illegally occupying land and all this stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't just kind of kind of going in. Uh, I don't know. I guess more kind of naive about it. But yeah, yeah, I would say for sure that um, if you came from, if you really just didn't know that much or weren't that interested in kind of what was going on geopolitically, and you were just like whatever Brooklyn Jew coming to Israel for a free trip. And you were just, oh, I'm spending this time with these people and they're being nice to me and I'm having sometimes good food. Um, then, you know, you would and, and maybe you're seeing like, oh, here's this like connection to this like um, spiritual thing. I mean, it was pretty crazy to see like the tomb of King David, seeing like the, the Western Wall um, uh, um, up on like the Golan Heights. There was like this mountain that's like mentioned in the Bible. There, there's a lot of kind of cool spiritual stuff. Um, so I could see very easily somebody coming into that and just being like, oh, these people are my bros. You know, they're they're cool. Um, you know, why are you talking trash about Israel? Those people are really cool to me, right? That That's like a very, that's, I feel like that's the base level, like normal human response to that kind of thing. Somebody who isn't a weird, you know, Twitch <laughs> debate, fucking whatever. Um, <laughs> politics, <laughs> politics person, right? Um, that's what I am. Isn't normal, right? Um, I think most most normal people will probably go in there and they'll be positively influenced, which is why they're they're doing it, of course. So I, I don't think that they shouldn't be allowed to do it, um, but I, I think the overall effect is that people get more sympathetic to Israel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that being said, like uh, name. Now you know that you're too old to have the trip. Uh, Actually, you, I just double getting... checked. It, it is thirty two. I can. I can it is thirty two. Oh. oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> right. Hell maybe, yeah. Maybe maybe you can just go this year or something. I don't know. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to do it really fucking fast though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you if you're seriously interested, I can talk to somebody. Uh, oh, cool. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. hit you up in the ends, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Free trip. So, yeah, I was too soon to talk, but I, uh, like, given what Socrates said, right, do you, do you feel, like, different, or do you, uh, do you still feel the same about that? Name. Oh, who, me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, no, not, I, not, I, it, it, it is really interesting to hear it, um, to, to hear like his perspective. Um, my brother also did it, and it was really interesting to hear his perspective. And he, he did like share a lot of concerns as well about the, uh, the indoctrination part of it. He was like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta like sit in a room and they're like, talking to you for two hours about how great israel is and that you, you i maybe maybe your experience was a bit different i i imagine there's like different programs and it was, it was like a yeah there's a lot ago. of different tours yeah yeah but but so like his experience was like he had to sit in a room and the and kind of like the um, the scam selling type the selling type thing where someone's like talking at you <laughs> for two hours um, by a time share in israel yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and but but then but then like uh once you're done with it you're done with it and you're like on basically a a, tour, uh, a guided vacation and he thought it was really interesting to visit for example the kibbutz see the different lifestyles uh of different communities in in, in the country and all that stuff and uh, of course yeah like that's shown because it gives a positive image of israel but like just because Israel does do fucked up things doesn't mean that there aren't positive things in Israel either. Mm -hmm. uh, like they, they aren't showing false things. Uh, those are those are there are normal people living there who are living normal lives who aren't uh, hunting Palestinians for sport and uh, oh my god, and th th that's, that's a reality too. Okay. Yeah, that's that's further east. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jeez, we Easy. didn't go that far east. You would have respond to that. No, um, I don't. <laughs> I don't think it's a very big problem, but I don't think it's like a, a necessary like good thing either. Like it, it is like a really cringe policy in and of itself. Um, I don't know. It, yeah. Well, it's a it's a private it's a privately funded, um, primarily. Like I I'm I'm not even sure actually how much like Israel as a state puts into it. I think it's largely like American philanthropists. Oh, um, I didn't know it was private. Can yeah. I I think it is, or it's, oh, it's like a collaboration with the government, I guess. They, okay. they, they do a lot of connections with it, but I think the like, money okay. is mostly If private. America comes out and be like, you know, we, we Water. want to um, have a special immigration status for British people because we were originally a British colony, and so like, you get preferential immigration treatment. Um, it'd be like, okay, that's kind of weird and cringe, um, and wouldn't it be something I'd support, but like, it wouldn't be the end of the world. That's kind of how I view it. I, can I yeah, ask you something? Uh, I, I want I want to debate through you, bro, you a, a bit, Elysium, but uh, I'm I'm not going to be mean. But like, how, how can you? Uh, what's the difference for you? How how can you argue that um, the the birth rate program is cringe? But I I know personally that you are like rather pro immigration. You're rather liberal when it comes to immigration. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a program that actively encourages immigration and and settlement into the country? Uh, or just having like passively more open borders. W w why the why what 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 makes it cringe? In your because uh, you're view? targeting a specific ethnicity with that immigration. It's like that'd be like why it would be cringe because if in the American example, it'd be like we want specifically to give preferential treatment to um, British people. We'd be like, okay, why? That's 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 what makes it cringe. Not the idea of immigrants. That that's fine. It's good for your economy and good for your country. It's that making it preferential to a certain ethnicity or a group of people or like religion or um, heritage thing. Okay, so th that's a really fair point. Uh, but, but I do want to nuance it a bit because we Go for it. like there, there actually there is a history to it. There, the, the reason why it's targeted to people, people with ties to, uh, to Jewish ethnicities is because it's, it's tied to the history of it being supposed to be like a, a refugee state post-World post War II. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is because we do have fast tracks for people uh, with different kinds of refugee statuses. Now, they, they don't last for 80 years, but like right now, Ukrainians who go into Poland, they, they get Polish uh, like integration to the Polish social security and all their paperwork goes through. It's all fast tracked, super, it's, um, it's yeah. instant. They're, they're, they're treated differently than other ethnicities when it comes to integration to the system. And the US does that too. Uh, Br Br Britain did that for Hong Kong when, the, when the China decided to break the, uh, the, the pact with it, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there is precedent for 
for the sure. well no there's precedence for refugees i just don't think it applies anymore which is why like originally it, i understand it become out so it came from like a more cringe time period being post-world war ii makes a lot more sense then but i don't think the idea that is still um qualifying as like a refugee policy makes sense anymore i think it should have ended like that that part is where it's transitioned to being cringe now i don't know like a definite year of where it becomes like refugee to cringe but i think we can draw a line in general and say by now you're not you're not um you're not importing refugees from europe and um post a a war against jews anymore right so that, that that's I I actually agree with that like that that's hundred percent fair though in, in practice from what I've heard and may, maybe Socrates you 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 like know something about this or not uh, what I've heard is that they've become extremely um, like really really liberal about who gets to claim birthright status uh, the, it, as much as early on it was very selective or not very selective but at least it, it was selective uh, what, what I've heard is that they become uh they, they'll accept you if even if you can like find something far away in your family tree that that like some vague connection so it, it's it's no longer basically why i'm bringing this up is because it's no longer this like strict ethnic uh thing it's more like on in in principle we have to we have to like have you find something so we can like at least kind of pretend you're you're of jewish origin but we don't actually care about that that, that that's also my impression What's interesting is it seems like they also uh, accept uh, uh, converts, like uh, converts to Judaism now as well. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So um, me and uh, me and my friend were gonna try to coach my non-Jewish friend to to get on to get on the tour, <laughs> try to coach him <laughs> to the questions. Um, so uh, <laughs> so when you when you like sign up to um, to try to like apply for it, they do like a phone interview. And they they ask you like a lot of stuff, and then at the airport, El Al, um, like the Israeli, uh, like airline, they um, they have people there that like, they kind of like interrogate you <laughs> about being Jewish, wow. uh, <laughs> which um, I found out I really enjoy having like um, like a, a little Israeli um, woman like. <laughs> <laughs> grilling me about stop being interrogated <laughs> i realized that's a kink for me i guess um but they were like really like it was really intense it was like oh you know what kind of food did your family cook for this holiday you know how like what did you do on this day and i'm like oh, i don't know we probably probably went to temple it's like and then what did you do it's like oh i don't know uh we went home um what did we eat i don't know fuck <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like i feel like i'm not nailing this um it was it was pretty intense um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, they're, um, I think they, they really like want, they want people who feel connected to Judaism to come there. So it's like, it's, it's, how do I say this? It's not that like, you have to be like, super, super Jewy for them to want you, but they want you to come because of Judaism. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, like, they want that to be your connection to it. Even, um, even if the like background stuff was all in name only and it got super relaxed, just the idea of that like being on top of your immigration policy is like weird on a weird level. Oh, it's yeah, not, it you're is, not just it accepting weird. immigrants anymore. You're saying mm -hmm. like we want this country's demographics to be skewed towards X thing, even if it's only a name only. You're setting like yeah. a, a, a a cringe element to it. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah I, I would I, say I it goes beyond. It, cringe. it just um, sounds to me that you don't like Israel being a Jewish state. I, I don't, yeah, I'm not an ethno statist. That's super weird. Yeah. And so, and so going even further, so um, if you're not like, I think like a certain type of like Orthodox Jewish, you're I mean, not I allowed agree. to get married hey, Metal Gamer. legally within Israel. Um, it's, it's like you have to, so the, the marriages, so like uh, I know in the US we kind of um, dealt with this a little bit when we we're thinking about like gay marriage and they were like, oh, okay, we have like civil unions. Like, how does this work? Is this like a church or a state thing? Um, but um, marriages in Israel are like religiously based, like at the state level, they're religiously based. It's not like you get a certificate and then you go see a rabbi later and you do like a ceremony that the ceremony is like the religious thing is like the legal thing. Those are tied together in Israel. Okay. Um, 
I, I want to say, uh, the, just like the reason I brought up the like uh, kind of opening up the restrictions on who can claim to be to have birthright, uh, like I, I, I personally agree. I, I think states should be um, should be a not atheist, but lay. They, 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 there should be separation mm -hmm. of religion and state. And I, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of ethno states or and, and all that stuff. Uh, just just wanted to make sure the like it, it's bad, but it's not as bad as it might look without bringing that nuance that it's a little bit better it's still bad that just want to make sure like, I, I don't want to sound like i'm supporting this like weird eth ethnic movement type of immigration you sound exactly like that just thank you <laughs> and also one thing i want to say socrates so basically you like uh, arrive at the airport in like uh, tel aviv or jerusalem or what whatever and the, the cops like you say you're jewish name three <laughs> jewish people is that no. what it is? No, so this is before you get there. So this is like I was flying through like New York. So okay. like at the at the airport in New York before before you get like on the plane or anything like that. No, they're like they're like grilling you in there. So um, they're not looking to see if you're like Jewish enough, if you eat enough like traditional foods. It's I think it's more like they're looking to see if you're like lying about stuff. Um, I think it's more of like a security I know thing, Zelensky. really, than. Um, I don't know. It's yeah. <laughs> it's more to look I for see. like discrepancies and I, it, I, like before this podcast, I watched something on YouTube, and there was one dude uh, who got basically uh, sent back home because of the mm. fact that uh, they found out that he wanted to join the trip to uh, to bang Israeli woman. Um, so That's that uh, he was like oh, pretty vocal oh. about that, and that was not accepted. Oh. So. Uh, yeah, what? but that would increase <laughs> their population. It's cringe to say it, but that's the point. Well, I don't think it's like was not line with the, the the religious values, right? Like it's a little mm -hmm. bit like he he just wanted to bang them. He do, doesn't want to breed. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I I I just have an issue with this, like overall, because if I can imagine, like uh, let's say, like uh, Lebanese is is like. Uh, starting <laughs> oh, some sort of foundation in what the same kind of way person. to get people to Iraq Jack's or going something, to to bang uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> with with like Jewish background and that kind of, or, or Jews with Muslim background, uh, I I think that would be banned in Denmark. I I, I cannot see that happen for, for Jewish people. It seems to be, but if if it's Arab and Muslim related, uh, I I think that would be banned, but. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know Wait, how you feel. Yeah. If it would be banned in Denmark, if Iraq said, hey, free trip, come visit your home country. Uh, yeah, with with the ties that it's like it has like a uh, Muslim, like uh, uh, you got to prove that you're Muslim and it's like to uh, promote Muslim culture or something along those lines. I, I don't. I I don't know. I I can't say what Denmark would do, but I don't think that sounds that bad. I mean, it sounds a little trivial, maybe. Um, I think it sounds like every country should do that. Every single country should have birthright. Okay, it sounds like a cool, fun trip. You go there. You it's paid for. It's free. Everyone should be able to experience that. I'm jealous. Okay, I'm jealous. Okay, name. Yeah, I want to add to that. I'm I'm like 99.999% sure that there are Muslim uh, organizations that will help Muslims do their trip to the Mecca, which is mm. like a very similar thing. You're it's like a big part of the culture. It's you have you have to do it in your lifetime if you're if you're a Muslim. Uh and it's it's like a trip. It doesn't have the idea of settling there, but you're still you're still traveling like back into the Arab world to uh to immerse yourself into the culture and and do like a religious thing so and that's completely tolerated i mean there's i i haven't heard anyone except like weirdo far-right people uh complain about that yeah yeah and i can say i can say even so um i've been pretty pretty harsh on on birthright and just a lot of the stuff but i i can say that you know a lot of the people who are working to like fund and organize this stuff um really just at a authentic like religious level believe that um you know jews should be able to come and like see see the holy land birth that's like what birthright means whatever i think that's the i think the religion is cringe 
Um, but there's a lot of people who like authentically believe that it's not, um, it's not just as kind of a propaganda tool. It is a lot of it is really heartfelt. Okay. So yeah, I think uh, that wraps it up like uh, pretty much. Unless if somebody still wants to, Lee, you still want to say something on this? Um, I mean, I, I would say I think it'd be much better if you want to add like qualifications to your immigration policies about like language or culture or something. Um, that seems fine, or in in like a very broad sense. But like to to yeah, once you get it down to like ethnicities or religious stuff, um, it seems like super weird. Um, I, I don't like know can, how culture is can... any more like better or different than what. Okay, yeah, culture is a bad like. word. You're right. Um, even language values values are like language makes perfect sense. What? Yeah. How does yeah. that make sense? But but like culture, ethnicity, race. How? What? Well, because Wait. language is going to be universally used in your country, right? Wait, doesn't Spain, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't Spain sort of do something like that where they um, they accept, uh, it's easier to get citizenship in Spain if you are from a, from a Spanish-speaking country. Um, mm. Is that, I feel like I've read something like that. Maybe it was a TikTok I saw. Hey, okay, if, if the Elysium wants Israel to be like this multicultural liberal haven, then I don't know why he would be okay with, hey, you know what, language barrier? Fine by me. That makes no sense to me. <laughs> how are you okay? I don't, I, because these like, things this, exist like, in how... the world. What do you mean? Wait, I don't understand. Well, I can't yeah, go I... in the world and change what languages people <laughs> speak. But you can say that a, 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 qual a criteria based on what like ethnicity you're born in is cringe, but a criteria based on what languages you know how to speak is, is not cringe. I don't understand how this is a problem. Yeah, and what's also realistic in the world is that people have different cultures and people have different ethnicities, and yet you think that the differentiating immigration based on those qualities are cringe, but not language. You have yet to yeah. you have yet to prove to me why those two are different. Okay, anyone can learn a language. I cannot change what ethnicity I was born as. Language is also going to be used. Elysium, in, please in learn. Oh, please let me please learn Russian tomorrow by tomorrow. Okay, you could do it. You could learn it. You got this. <laughs> you you could. Someone could if they want to live in Russia, and, and and it's not even like a requirement for most stuff. Just showing that you like want to learn the language or you have some knowledge of the language gives you preferential treatment so in how can is so how can israel stuff. become a multicultural haven if like the requirement to be there in the first place is to speak i, I don't i don't know what they speak it's like judea you can get on pretty well with just just english uh honestly most places yeah i mean yeah because um, that's how the world is trained because english is based um but like anyone you can any ethnicity can have any culture right you can have any ethnic background and be a member of a certain type of culture. These aren't exclusive, right? But you can't be a member of any ethnicity if you weren't born as that, right? That's the, I mean, this is the, the difference. Something being like malleable versus being inal inalienable. So making an in, 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 I can't even speak, whatever. Making a restriction that you can't change is cringe. Okay, name? Yeah, I also just want to add, like, it, like, it really is just practically so much easier to function in a country if you speak the language like if you if you go for a residency permit in any country and you're like yeah i'm, I'm already like semi-fluent in the language they'll be like oh great so we can work here already you'll be able to you won't be lost navigating the administration like filing paperwork etc you're actually going to be a functional citizen like right off the bat yes That's, and what's that, also what's also like really functional to the jewish state is for people to be jewish right so then maybe the ethnicity part on pr the practicality part isn't that so cringe, but Elysium is. Like, hey, I'm trying to pinpoint down an inconsistency from Elysium because it's pissing me <laughs> off. It's an inconsistency. Yes, it is. I, I I, I, it, like the language, how? language and culture are different. Like language and culture, language and ethnicity, those are those are disconnected. I. You do realize that yeah. like language is a part of a culture. Yeah. I mean, it sure. can be. But what, what do you everyone mean is can gravitating be? towards English, right? Right now, English no, is a pretty... No, everybody is gravitating Western towards Chinese. Language. Okay. 
Well, okay. English and is like, a pretty this, Western like, language. This isn't, yeah? this isn't about like, oh, is English the thing that everybody should be jumping on? I'm, not, I'm, I'm just, hammering. I'm I tried I'm, to make an example. I'm Never hammering. Mind. I'm just hammering you on like, you think X, Y, and Z is cringe? <laughs> Something else yeah. is not cringe, but yet, like, you, you still haven't. Those the differences that you, you said don't make any sense to me. Those are not good okay. differences. How do you not understand the difference? I can change what languages I speak. I cannot change what I was born as. Yes? Do you understand okay. that concept? Okay, so then like, okay, yes. The concept that is, is what, the concept. What, okay, no, shut up. What the concept is what is immutable and what isn't immutable, right? Yes. But just because something isn't immutable doesn't mean that you can put a requirement on it. I you guys want to move on? No, I don't. <laughs> No, I mean, you don't. You, yes, you can. Make, you can make mutable requirements that are still cringe, Chow. I agree with that. I'm just saying, if you're gonna so make why, one, so why? So why are you still saying that language isn't cringe if that's the case? Because I don't think that's one of them. And why isn't it one because, of them? Because you have to be able to communicate with other people in the place you go, and that takes time. And so a country is saying, "Hey, you have no connections here, and you have no way to communicate with people here. How are you going to function in our society?" Is a reasonable criteria to ask someone. Okay, we, we, we're going to move on. Uh, that being said, we can all agree that French as a language is cringe. True. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, just, kidding. Uh, just kidding. I'm just, uh, I'm just poking fun. Uh, but, uh, Sacre bleu. So, yeah, that being said, like, uh, we have been going for a while now. Uh, we still are going to continue on uh, with our next panel. Uh, that being said, that's going to be in like uh, 45 minutes. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know what I got to do in the meantime. So I'll just like uh, go like here, do another thing. Uh, yeah, is that, that's how you get the, the, the subs, right? Um, no, but. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, that being said, like, uh, I really appreciate that uh, everybody came on today and uh, it, was, it was good fun. And uh, I appreciate our guests for coming. So, uh, Lemonese. And uh, Socrates TV, I appreciate that you guys were able to come on. Um, please give them a follow or whatever. Uh, and of oh, course, pepper. we got our, yeah, whatever else. Uh, maybe follow you on Instagram. Maybe you can do that. True. Right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that being said, like, well, also, we got our panelists uh, at JJ Live, uh, Elysium, and Neymanen. Give them a follow as well. I really appreciate that everybody came on. So uh, yeah, that being said, like I'm probably going to wrap it up here. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, should I uh, should I just continue on streaming? Wanna hang out, name? <laughs> um, oh no, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hang out. Okay. Yeah, we, we need a topic then. What's the topic? <laughs> Um, fuck. Right, I'm. I'm. Like, look, you, you find it. I'm still shouting out people in my chat. Okay. Okay. I'm. I'm. I'm doing work here. All right. I'm now <laughs> gonna shout out people in my chat, but uh, I'm also gonna hop off. So, uh, you guys enjoy your body modification panel. That's happening soon, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Fifty minutes. So. Yeah, fifty minutes, something like that. Yeah. All right. So uh, enjoy. Ciao, ciao. Appreciate it. Bye bye. Right. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah. No bye. problem. Bye. God, fucking Elysium's giga cringe. Uh, sorry for your child closure. Is an argument won't be there tonight. Um, Elysium just had bad arguments. If if he believes it is reasonable for people to share a language, then it would also be reasonable for some people to be like, yeah, let's also share a culture. Let's also share and ethnicity. Let's also share a religion. Stream Elements is Israeli? Really? I got a boycott. Boycotting Stream Elements. Going back to Stream Labs and, them, and supporting them stealing OBS for slobs. Uh, JChow Live, you could also cut your leg off. Requiring people to have peg legs is 100% valid. Hey, it's immutable. It's a choice. God. Uh, I work in Tel Aviv, and 
In my work, I speak 90% English, so to push Americans to move to Israel seems like language shouldn't be a barrier. I don't think language should be a barrier to people moving. Um, I think if people are going to be moving to a country, they should personally make an effort to learn the languages needed in order to work there and live there properly. Uh, you make the case for refugees that like, yeah, languages aren't going to stop you from becoming an asylum seeker and trying to get to a country to be a refugee at, yeah? Um, yeah, I don't know what he was on with Israel being this, like, English international state. He wants Israel, like, ideally, and I, I, I have to agree with him on this, but, like, at the end of the day, it's idealist, right? It's just, it's, um, it's so empty. That, like, he wants Israel to be this multicultural liberal haven where, like, everybody is respected. All ethnicities there are respected. But then when all of a sudden you start advocating for, like, you know what? Language barriers, language requirements aren't cringe. I, I, I don't know how you could possibly be in favor or, like, w want to advocate for a multicultural country when when you have a language requirement. Like, that's one of the reasons why the United States does not have an official language. Like, this is such a huge misconception that the English is the official language in the United States. It's, like, probably, you could say, like, the official language in terms of business, as well as the official language in terms of, like, most of the documents that you have, that you do, and whatnot. But also in the United States, you have translators for those documents. You have different versions of those documents and things like that. You don't actually need to learn English in order to live in the United States. Now, functionally, at like a high level is a different situation that's a different argument that's a different debate but like to be like you know what that's 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 not cringe but anything else when it comes to like and also like language is is like you could argue is like technically immutable like you could change it but like or is it Oh, yeah, it's technically unimmutable because you, you could change it and you could learn multiple languages and whatnot. But, like, it's it's basically immutable. It is functionally immutable. And the reason why is because at a certain age, if you were trying to learn a new language, you just can't. It's, like, it's not impossible, but it's, it's incredibly difficult. Like, the languages that you learn early on, they stick with you. Uh, in Quebec, there was a push to put French language tests for people to be able to immigrate. And you know what? Like, I don't think... At the end of the day, I'm just still really confused as to why Elysium, with the beliefs that he has, and with what he's been saying, is okay with language barriers. Like, I really don't see a huge difference between... There being an 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 ethnicity, a barrier to ethnicity, and then a requirement to language. Like I really just don't see the, the difference between a huge difference between the two. Right now, there are some tests, but they are super easy if I remember correctly. Uh, you won't ever use a language as a native joke, neo jealousy, and so on. Yeah. Uh, Elysium lost all of his Quebec Quiz points. What happened with Quebec? Uh, passive genocide, oof. Hey, Elysium today just like kind of just came mask off. He was like, you know what? Let's accelerate. Let's accelerate uh, ethnic cleansing so we could achieve our one state solution. Oh, Bucky, by the way, that's not how you spell Elysium. It's with a, it's I-L-L-S-I-U-M. Elysium would love some Quebecois politicians immigration policy. <laughs> Learn Russian. <laughs> Uh, are you arguing that Israel should allow specific immigrants based on language? Uh, true level alert. Elysium is okay with Israel allowing, with, with like having a language requirement, but is not okay with Israel having like a ethnicity requirement or a religion requirement. Language is a part of culture. Yeah, I, I made that point and people did not vibe with that. I don't, I don't know. Even like among people who speak the same language. Because he said everyone is tending trending towards English and language isn't important. That is such a shitty argument.
not like not everybody is trending towards English. There's a trend of a group of people increasingly towards English, but not everybody knows English. You would get crucified for that opinion in some Quebec circles. Hell, you even have languages that are mutually understandable. The difference between a dialect and a language is as much about culture as it is about linguistics. Yeah, and that's why Ukraine and Russia are one and the same. Wait, I said that ironically. Don't clip it. Yeah. Um It's been a while since I've been like pissed off at Elysium. It's been a while since I've heard like so many bad takes. So many bad so so much like of a wrong understanding of what's going on in the world. Like w one of the cringest things I heard tonight was that like oh nowadays the the concept of the nation state is gone. I don't know how fucking naive you have to be to look at the world right now and be like, yeah, the age of the nation state, that's that's all history. When most countries out there are nation states and most people out there are nationalists. As well as they're also globalists, but it's not like every single country is like some multicultural haven. And that, like, that's the standard now, is that all countries right now are multicultural havens. That is such an incorrect understanding of the current world. And that is also such an incorrect understanding of, like, what is the standard? This sounds like the world equals the West meme. Um, You know, I, it, it, it sounds like Elysium believes the rest of the world is like the United States. In which is like, one, it's not, and two, the United States is not like, is not the cult, multicultural haven that I would want it to be. Not like we have Taiwan slash Ukraine right now. Uh, I don't know if Elysium would make the same argument for any other minority. I was late to the party. What is your hot opinion about Israel and Palestine? It's not really any hot opinion. I guess like the only hot opinion I would have is like anybody who is arguing so much in favor of a one-state solution versus a two-state solution and vice versa is cringe because both are equally unrealistic. And so then for one of them to say, yeah, my solution is better, yours is unrealistic, and then for the other side to say the same thing, I think that's giga cringe. And what were my arguments about? Um, there were three topics. The last one was about birthright summary TLDR. Uh, I think birthright is like part of the larger problem that I have with Israel, but it's not it's not like a significant part. So like I don't have strong feelings or thoughts against or for birthright. Then two-state, one-state solution. I personally would prefer a two-state solution. But a one-state solution and a two-state solution are both equally unrealistic. And then the first question, since this was the beginning. Oh, how should like the West, the United States, and the EU behave towards Israel? And my hot take was they shouldn't. On the basis of interests. On the basis of morality, of course, uh, they, they should be doing a lot more to pressure Israel. But when it came when it comes down to interests, I don't see Israel changing. I don't see the United States changing. I don't see the West changing. And a huge part of that, which was me mentioning this a lot, was that like not only is there an interest but there's also an issue of influence in that there's the Israeli lobby that is really uh, 
pushing both the United States public and the government to be supportive of Israel. So that's also something that you have to deal with if you want the United States or the West or any other country to be against Israel. Well, you're going to have to deal with the Israeli lobby. Uh, not like Canada, where we've achieved a gay-based communism and multicultural haven. <laughs> yeah, there's no racism in Canada. I know Zelensky. He's my token Jew. Base education man. Uh, Pandart. Sounds like you've been watching somebody else's stream and you only know me as the education man. <laughs> Israel, the U.S. bulwark against the Salafist woman um, international. In the Middle East. Should have saw that, but I didn't. Uh, I had a busy day. Um, I'm gonna have to cut stream short. Actually, I can't stay on long. Yeah, I didn't remember your name first, and you were answering education to all questions. <laughs> yeah. Where am I? Oh, wow, you noticed. I'm in the same place. I just, I moved positions. And I moved furniture around. It took a while. I also did it high. Which probably wasn't the best idea. And I like it better. I think the stream environment is a lot more of like my personality and my interests. Uh, whereas before, it was a bit more, some will say professional, but bland. And I, I used to have my stream in a similar setting like this. But I, I have a lot more stuff on the walls now. Actually, I, I just have one more stuff on the wall. It looks completely different. <laughs> Bucky just finally tuned into stream and like looked at the screen, looked at the room. <laughs> uh, you were, you were on a while back on Tuesday. Sounds like you need another day of rest. Um, I think like every day for me has been busy. Like there's there's not a, that's 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 the reality of having a job, and I'm I'm not talking about streaming. Or content creation. I'm talking about like actually waking up, going to work, doing work, coming back, and then being like, wow, that was a day, you know? I've changed lighting as well. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's a lot less dark. And I think for this setup, it needs to be a lot less dark. What's also... I, I Actually, I didn't change a lot about the lighting. Um, Probably the only difference is this. Like, really. I, I'm I'm using the same lights, but because it's a lot more like constrained into a corner, then the lighting is a lot more effective. The lighting was like blue before, yeah, because it was dark and it was a big room. Uh, sucky thing about adulting is getting up and putting on pants. I hate pants. To me, the sucky thing about adulting is getting out of bed. I love it. I love sleeping. It's one of my favorite pastimes. Any time I have a day off, weekends, I'm sleeping until noon. My blankets, my bed are just so comfortable. Like it's just, it's so good to just lay there and be like, wow, you know, it's 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 very relaxing. Which is like the antithesis of some people who are like, I need to get out of bed. I need to start doing work. I need to start being productive. And I'm just like, what? Be lazy. I think a lot of that hassle has to do with me being a stoner. 
I definitely think being a stoner has maybe a bit more lazy. Um, but as I said before, I I have to go. I can't stay for long. Um, it turns out that I actually I I might have lost something really valuable at Boston, and I need to track it down. So I'm gonna go deal with that, and hopefully I have some good news for you guys on Saturday for me. The Devil's Lettuce took another one. <laughs> Not like this. Um. But this has been me, Jay Chow. This is the Jay Chow Live broadcast. Hope you guys had a fantastic time watching. Thank you for watching, by the way. And I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the day. Until Saturday which is the next time I stream. Saturdays, I might make it my... I might make it my drunk slash get high stream days. I also want to start getting back on anime movie nights. A couple of weeks ago, we watched the first Evangelion rebuild. I want to get to watching the rest of the rebuild. So if we have interest, some interest, then this Saturday after stream, a the second Evangelion rebuild, Maple Story stream. Ha ha ha! Thanks for my brain. Yeah, no problem. Um, I definitely want to like stream longer and talk more and like you know answer questions and explore more. Um, you, know, I, you lost point. <laughs> Is it because of Evangelion? It's okay. I I lose a lot of points with me with people. It's because I have a lot of different things. You know. It's because of the rebuild. Um, you see, okay, like, the, the rebuilds are pretty contentious. I I don't like Evangelion, by the way. I watched the original. I did not like it. And I'm actually more into the rebuild so far than the original. It's because the first movie was a recap. And it was better animation, which I like. Um, I think it, it, it misses a lot of, like, the, the deep stuff and the symbolic stuff. It's, it's a lot more modern and a lot less of, of, like, you know, there are, of, like, I guess the, the classic, oh, deep meaning and, uh, and, like, up for interpretation, kind of, like, abstract interpretation. It's kind of, like, abstract art. I'm definitely more into the rebuilds, but I haven't watched the second and I haven't watched the third. And I've been told that um, it's it's not as bad as people make it out to be, but it is there 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 is a debate. And I think I understand what everyone is saying. I don't think it's that bad. I think I actually think a lot of people are exaggerating how bad the rebuilds are. There are and there are genuine Evangelion fans out there that like the rebuilds. It's bad as people say. <laughs> I just think. But I will see. Maybe, maybe. Uh we'll we'll see on Saturday, you know. Uh maybe you could join. Join the, the it, which by the way, it's gonna be in the Discord. So if you want to join me for a anime movie night, then join the Discord. Uh I will see no spoilers for you. I I've already kind of been spoiled because I've listened and I, I've seen things in and here and there and whatnot. But yeah. Uh, true. Thanks for your brain. P.S. How much would it cost to lend your brain on the cloud? Not a lot. I don't. I don't think my brain is that special. I have a bad case of Dunning Kruger, of like low confidence. So yeah, that's my answer. I don't think. I don't think the cost would be that high. You know. All right. Uh, so that's me. How many people are watching? Four. Okay, you know what? That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Let's let's send you guys over to. Wait, why is Chinchilla not streaming? I thought Chinchilla was streaming. 
What? Hello? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm sending you guys over to Socrates. He was a cool guy. Socrates is always cool. He has a good head on, on, on his shoulders. Um, he paused? What does that mean? You know, I, I really don't get how Chinchilla will have, like, multiple events during the day for stream and then, own, and then like, have multiple streams. Like, why don't, just, just stream all the way. Stream all the way. Okay, well, uh, that's me. Thanks for watching, guys.